Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Weed Biocontrol Summit. Thank you for joining us. We begin by acknowledging that we gather today on the ancestral homelands of the Indigenous people of this continent. Please join me in expressing our deepest respect and gratitude for their enduring care and protection of our shared lands and waterways. My name is Jennifer Andres. I am co-chair of Naisma's Classical Biocontrol Committee. We are joined today by Carrie Lima Brown, our other co-chair, and our summit moderators, Melissa Maggio, who will introduce the speakers, and Wade Simmons, who will manage the Q&A box. We would like to thank everyone who helped pull the summit together. This summit is sponsored by the USDA Forest Service and coordinated by Naisma's Classical Biocontrol Committee members and Naisma staff. Their generous support allowed this to be a free event open to the public. I would now like to introduce Belle Bergner, Naisma's Executive Director, who will share a bit about our organization. Thank you, Jen, and welcome everyone. It's so nice to see so many people joining us um, on a probably a busy day for everyone. It's a busy holiday season, so thank you so much for being here today. Um, if you are new to NASMA, the North American Invasive Species Management Association, our mission is to support, promote, and empower invasive species prevention and management in North America. And biocontrol is obviously a critical and growing strong tool in that effort. We cannot do what we do without the support of our members. So for those of you who are members, thank you so much for your support. If you are not a member, please consider joining us. Not only do you support us, but you get access to an incredible resource of materials to help you hopefully um, do your job a little easier. We have webinars, we have a library of probably over 50 presentations at this point, um, lots of great information. We have a monthly First Friday networking hour, uh, which we're having one tomorrow, in fact. Um, discounts, um, access to our Play Clean Go outreach and education uh, resources and materials, our newsletter, and much more. So um, again, thank you members who are joining us today, and I hope you'll consider being a part of our community. And finally, I just want to put a plug for our annual conference that will be next year, just a little less than a year away in beautiful Fort Myers, Florida, just across from Sanibel Island. If you've never been there, you need to go. It'll be fantastic. And we will undoubtedly have several presentations of the latest biocontrol research. Um, there is a, a, a USDA uh, research center right near our conference center. So um, definitely put that on your calendars if you haven't already. And um, with that, I want to thank our uh, uh, the, the tremendous work that the committee, the biocontrol committee has put into this. Um, just so much work has gone into this. And thank you so much to our speakers today who will share their uh, very hard work on this important topic. And with that, I will turn it back over to Jen. The focus of our summit this year is on international collaborations, which are a critical component in developing weed biocontrol opportunities for our most troublesome weeds. Without foreign exploration and research and development through international collaborations, weed biocontrol simply would not exist. Today, we will hear from international partners spanning five continents that will help make biocontrol a readily available weed management tool for North America. The Naisma Classical Biocontrol Committee wants to continue to strengthen and expand our biocontrol community, and your input is valuable. We will be sending a post-summit survey and would appreciate feedback on content, future events, improvements, and community growth opportunities. You are also welcome to contact any of us directly. A few housekeeping items before we begin. If time allows, after each speaker, we will have a formal Q&A. Please type your questions in the Q&A box, not the chat, and they will either be answered live or answered in the Q&A box. Thank you to all our speakers for making time to share your interesting work. Thank you again to USDA Forest Service for sponsoring this summit and Biocontrol Committee members and Naisma staff for running everything so smoothly. And with that, Melissa, would you like to introduce our first speaker? Thank you, Jen. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. Our first speaker today is Harriet Hins from Cabby, Switzerland. 
I will turn it over to you, Harriet. Thanks a lot, Melissa, and uh, thanks to the whole NISMA Biocontrol Steering Committee for organizing this summit again and for giving Kebby the opportunity to present. My name is Harry Tins. I'm slightly changed positions within Kebby, uh, being since October the Global Director uh, for Invasive Species, but for the time being, I will remain responsible for the weed section at Kebby in Switzerland and the center is what you see on this picture. Just a few words about CABI. We are an international not-for-profit organization. We are also intergovernmental. We are owned by 50 member countries. We have a global reach of about 450 staff in over 20 locations worldwide. We address issues of global concern, such as food security and food safety. Apart from research, we also conduct international development projects. And we are also a major publisher of scientific information. Maybe you know our books, ebooks, compendia, especially maybe the um, online available invasive species compendia. These are our member countries. Um, we have, for instance, Canada and Australia on board. We are still working on the US to become a member. Here, our 11 research centers. So apart from the operation in Switzerland, we have um, an important center in the UK, but also in Asia, Africa, uh, South America. And of course, these centers can also help us in our foreign exploration activities. I come now to the team in Switzerland. We have five research scientists, Sonja, Patrick, Phil, Gislen, and Ivo Tosevsky, who sits in Serbia. We have three permanent technical assistants and about five to 10 temporary research assistants, also called summer students. Together with our UK center, we currently work on 20 weed biocontrol projects, mainly for the US and Canada. Our UK center also has two projects uh, for Hawaii, wild ginger and blackberry. And in total, we work on about 45 different biocontrol agents. The green highlighted ones are the weeds that I'm going to present in a minute. On four of these, we work with EBCA in Italy and with two on, um, on two with EBCL in Montpellier, France. Before I start, just a quick word on reporting, since I'm going to rush through the projects. Um, I just want to point out that in August each year, we produce a progress report that I send around to a large uh, distribution list as a PDF. In case you're not on this distribution list yet, please send me an email. For most of our projects, we also produce more detailed annual reports for a smaller group of people. So again, in case you're interested in any of our projects in particular, just contact us. And of course, there's our website and this is mostly, this is pretty well up to date, I would say. So feel free to visit that as well. The first one, is Russian Olive, conducted by my colleague Phil, who worked on, or he, who does work on an aerophyte mite, which reduces seed output of this invasive tree. The work was conducted mostly at Kebby in Switzerland, but in close collaboration with collaborators in Iran, with BBC in Italy, and also Turkish and Serbian scientists. In 2012, um, 19, sorry, a joint petition was submitted by Tim Collier and Rosemary de Clark Float. TAG recommended release in 2020, which was not too surprising because this mite is very specific. In this particular case, Canada did not issue a release permit, not uh, due to concerns for its specificity, but because of insufficient impact data. In the meantime, Rose and Phil have compiled more impact data and sent their response to Canadian authorities in 2021. In the US, a biological assessment is currently being circulated. In Switzerland, Phil is maintaining a uh, rearing of a Serbian population of the mite in view of future shipments. Russian Nepweed is also one of Phil's projects. 
he's mainly working on a leaf mining jumping weevil. I didn't realize that weevils can also jump, but this one can. He, within only two years, he was able to test 72 species uh, because the, this insect has an extremely fast turnaround under quarantine conditions. Only three of these 72 test species supported limited adult development in no choice tests. So that looks pretty promising. Very preliminary results also show that a combination of larval mining and adult feeding can uh, stunt plants and even kill shoots at high densities. What's needed is an open field test in the native range of this insect in Kazakhstan to confirm its environmental safety and to conduct surveys for additional agents. But that will obviously depend on future COVID measures. Hori cress is one of our, one of our brassicaceae weeds. We have been working on a goal forming weevil, Suturingus cardariae, which was first petitioned in 2011. Tech requested additional tests due to its relatively broad physiological host range. These data were collected and Mark Schwarzlander from the University of Idaho resubmitted the petition in January 2020. The tech response we received <clears throat> said that they cannot recommend its release without reservations for the time being. We did um, submit um, additional arguments to APHIS and we hope that we can still find a way forward for this weevil. There is a second um, weevil, a seed feeder, which is extremely specific, in fact, nearly monospecific, but this one will only reduce the spread of our requests, not existing stems. We still think that it could be a nice addition to the aerophyte mite that Jeff Littlefield recently released. There is a very similar weevil, Suturinkus marginellus, on perennial pepperweed. <clears throat> Very similar in terms of biology, but also host range. So it also has a broad physiological host range. Uh, so we discontinued work um, in order to first see what will happen with Euterinchus cadariae. Now that we think that we might have a way forward for that one, Sonia resumed work <clears throat> in 2021. Under relatively artificial single choice conditions, she, she found a clear preference for perennial pepperweed. In addition, we sent weevils to Mark uh, at the University of Idaho for bioassays and host finding behavior. And so we're planning to continue with this insect in 2022. Oxidase is another of Sonia's projects. The, the agent further advanced is a root mining tortricid moth. A joint petition again was submitted actually uh, just last week and this week by Rose and Jeff. Mm, in this particular case, oxidase is also a problem in Australia. And uh, Sonia has conducted additional tests with Australian test species, which are almost, almost completed. Then there is a second Dichoramfa species, a shoot mining moth, for which studies on its biology are still ongoing. And there's two additional agents. One is a root galling tephritid fly, which forms these potato-like structures on the roots, causing negative impact on biomass and seed production. Both specificity tests are well advanced and results look very promising so far. And the last one is a root feeding weevil in the genus Euphocleonus, quite similar to the one on nepweeds. Very damaging, the larval feeding can actually kill plants. However, it's not quite as specific. It can develop quite happily on the ornamental Shasta daisy and on herbal chamomile. But for Australia, this could still work. We will see. Another of Sonia's projects is common tansy, also Nestoraceae. The biocontrol agent most advanced here is a stem mining weevil. The work is mostly conducted by our collaborators at the Zoological Institute in St. Petersburg, Russia. Testing is almost complete. In this case, it's mostly native species in the same genus as Tanacetum that are critical. Some 
development can happen on these plants, but really very occasionally under natural conditions. So a petition will likely be prepared next winter. A second species is a leaf feeding beetle. Again, the native Tanacetums are an issue, but Sonia is currently looking at that again in an open field test. And a third species is a, is a plume moth, quite curious life cycle. The adults lay eggs in summer in the uh, developing flower heads. The first larvae, the first larvae mine in the flower head but the actual damage occurs in the following spring when older larvae start mining in the developing vegetative shoots. This kind of two-phased life cycle makes testing quite complicated. In addition, it's difficult to get the flowering synchronized of test species and the controls. But in open field tests so far, Sonia got pretty encouraging results. Next is field bindweed. Um, that was, this project was started by the late Rich Hansen. John Gaskin recently took over as consortium chair and he submitted our test plant list to take this spring. He received very uh, helpful comments that we will obviously consider. In the meantime, Gislan here at the center is concentrating on acromycid fly the larvae of Mitch mine in the shoot and root crown of the plant. It's again a bit difficult to work with this insect because it doesn't function too well under confined conditions. So Shislin has been concentrating on open field tests for the time being, which are very encouraging. The advantage of this insect is that it also occurs in very disturbed sites, for instance, at um, maize field edges. In the and in parallel, Ivo Tosevsky in Serbia is working on a sessate moth, which is extremely damaging. In fact, he has problems keeping the controls alive because this insect um, yeah, needs a lot of food and can basically kill plants over winter. In addition, tests, even under no choice conditions, have so far shown a, a very high specificity. So we have big hopes for this one. Garlic mustard, uh, that was actually our first brisicacy weed. And we concentrated on a root mining weevil, again, a very damaging one, which can kill overwintering rosettes. In this respect, it's a little bit similar to Mogulonus crucifer on hound's tongue. It was first petitioned in 2008. And I cannot go into details here, but due to concerns of its environmental safety, we had to conduct um, several additional tests it was resubmitted, but TAG finally recommended release in 2017. In the meantime, it was released in Canada by Rob Boucher. And in August, 2021, our partners at the University of Minnesota submitted um, an additional dossier with additional test results to APHIS. So we are waiting uh, for their answer. Then there is a second weevil, again, a seed feeder <clears throat> for which a petition is in preparation and which is even more specific than this root weevil. Flowering rush, um, that's my colleague, Patrick Hefliger. He's working mostly on the insect furthest advanced is a semi-aquatic weevil, Bacchus nodulosus, uh, for which specificity tests and impact studies are completed and a petition will likely be submitted in early 2022 by Jennifer Andreas and Rob Boucher, again a joint petition. Then Patrick is also working on an acromycid fly for which studies are ongoing. And finally, there is a white smut that our UK center works on. The problem there is that <clears throat> the smut is rather too specific. Um, so there currently still looking for strains that are attacking the most common North American genotypes of flowering rush. Patrick is also working on common reed. He actually did his PhD on this uh, plant. Mm, he uh, was mainly working on two shoot mining noctuid moss. 
which were first released in Canada in 2019. But at the moment, it is very unlikely that they will be released in the US. Cabby is maintaining a rearing and shipping eggs, and that sounds maybe trivial, but it's not. It's actually extremely time consuming and even shipments um, are quite time consuming at the time being and challenging. In 2021, Patrick and his team found um, a method to uh, improve the rearing considerably by rearing young larvae on common reed and older larvae on artificial diet. That produced fertile adults, but still saved a lot of time. They were able to produce close to 23,000 eggs and conducted three shipments to Canada. So we are very hopeful that this, um, these moths will establish soon. The project on swallow warts is also an older one. And the work on the leaf beetle Chrysocus was actually started by Aaron Reed uh, from the university, uh, from Rhode Island University. Mm, at the moment, Shizlen is working with a French population of this beetle. The adults are defoliators, but it's mostly the larvae causing the damage. They feed for one to up to three years on the roots of the plant. In larval transfer tests, <clears throat> she found that few larvae survived on four native Asclepia species, but she didn't find adult emergence. Two of these four Asclepia species were also exposed in open field tests, and under these conditions, none of them were attacked. So the again, this beetle seems to be very specific under more natural conditions. The second one is a fruit fly, Euphronta connexa. It's much more challenging to work with. It's particularly challenging to synchronize the availability of fruits of test plants and controls with the oviposition of the insect. So for the time being, we are not conducting, we are not continuing any tests. And we are also have, uh, also because we have very limited funding on this project. The last one is Parrot's Feather. We started that um, last year, uh, funded by British Columbia. It is also invasive in the Western US. So Phil is currently trying to um, obtain additional funding uh, potentially from the US. The challenge here is not only host specificity because there are native Muriel Fulum species, but also climate, because two of the three potential biocontrol agents originate in South America, where the climate is obviously much milder. The first one, a leaf feeding beetle, um, Lysathia, he obtained from the Center for Biological Control in South Africa, and he currently has that in rearing here in Switzerland. He's hoping to receive the second one, the stem mining weevil Listronotus from Fuidi in Argentina next year. And there is a third insect, a stem mining weevil, which is actually native to North America. So that one could be interesting, uh, similar to the weevil that is used in augmentative control on Muriophyllum spicatum. Good, that's all I had. Um, and I just realized that I didn't use all of my time. So there is time for questions. Thank you very much for listening. Maybe I will stop sharing. Well, thanks so much for covering so much ground, Dr. Heens. And there is a question in the, in the Q&A and um, it's regarding the biocontrol agents that were released for garlic mustard in Canada. And the question is, is there any evidence that they are moving south across the border into the United States? Uh, for the time being, not. In fact, Rob so far only found very slight evidence of establishment. Mm, so at the moment, they have not really reached any density yet to even redistribute. So, yeah. Great. I'm not sure in which sense this was meant, whether positive or negative, but um, anyway, we are not there yet. Great. There's a few more coming in. Um, one is relating to the Phragmites biocontrol. And the question is, why is it unlikely for the US? And is it likely or possible that it also will cross the border and arrive from Canada? Mm -hmm, mm 
Um, so there is a scale insect, which is damaging native Phragmites in Louisiana. And basically, people are scared that if we now release the noctuid moss, uh, they could um, contribute further or threaten further the, the native Phragmites. Um, but yeah, I believe it's actually, we, we do think that the, the insects are unlikely to establish um, in Louisiana because they're more used to temperate climate. Um, yeah, in this case, it could well be that they actually move over naturally from Canada to the US. Great, thank you. And I think we have time for one more. And this is relating back to the garlic mustard biocontrol. And the question was, is there, do you know where in Canada the releases were made? In Ontario. Okay, actually, I think we might have time for one more, uh, a bunch coming in here. Um, why are some biocontrols tested in their native range? And is that the native range of the plant, the insect, or both? It's uh, much easier to test the insect in the native range because you can work under natural conditions. If you only do the testing in quarantine, the insects are facing very artificial conditions and you might not be able to really determine their host range, their actual host range um, in the field. Um, so yeah, so we do have the luxury uh, that a lot of our agents do occur in Central Europe. So we can work with them in Switzerland um, in the common garden, conduct open field tests, and um, therefore I think can determine the environmental safety of these agents much, much better than if you would only do the testing in quarantine. Well, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Hins, and I'm going to pass it back over to Melissa. Yeah, thank you so much, Harriet, and thank you, Wade, for a great question and answer. Our next presenter is Renee Sforza with USDA ARS European Biological Control Laboratory in France. I will turn it over to you, Renee. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, René Scorza, and I am a biological control scientist at the USDA ARS European Biological Control Laboratory, located in southern France. Uh, I would like first to thank the organizer of this nice my, meeting summit for uh, the invitation. Um, I will briefly give you an update on three invasive plant species in North America and originating from Eurasia, which are swallowwort, uh, French broom, and uh, Medusa dry. Before that, let me a little bit introduce some more lab, a USDA lab near Montpellier. Our mission is to study classical biological control of uh, invasive insect pests and weeds from North America. And uh, we conduct uh, foreign exploration in Europe, Africa, and Asia. And uh, also we run uh, some genetic studies and biological and ecological evaluation of our targets. Our lab is uh, present in Europe since uh, 1919. And we recently, just before the COVID, uh, COVID pandemic, celebrated our 100 years of existence. Today, or uh, maybe I should say tonight for us uh, in Europe, uh, I will focus my talk on these weeds. The first one is swallowwort, which is mostly uh, originating from uh, Central Europe. And the last two species are growing in the Mediterranean climate, French broom and Medusa. I, I won't um, go too far into the details of each project, as I preferred uh, to give you an overview of what uh, we're doing but I'll be happy to get in touch with some of you if you're interested in more details, of course. This target, uh, as mentioned by Ariet uh, earlier, uh, is an um, interesting target because there are two species that are invasive in North America. The black uh, swallowwort and Vincitoxicum nigrum on the left, uh, part of this uh, 
of this slide, and Vincitoxicum rossicum, also called pale swallowwort. And the, the current invasion of both is in the east of the US and Canada. They invade pretty much the same habitats as uh, you can see on this uh, slide from open habitats and woodlands to woodlands like here in uh, New York state along the Hudson River. Both species are perennial climbing vines that form uh, extensive patches sometimes, like here in the story, and overgrow native uh, vegetation. Here is the distribution in Europe, or I should say in Eurasia. Uh, together with the black and the pale, uh, we also have the white swallowwort, which has been introduced into the US, but uh, didn't install. Um, but uh, currently, this is the species the most uh, abundant and common uh, in Europe. So interestingly, over the years, we have found a, a beetle, uh, a chrysomelid beetle uh, in France. This, this one is very, very nice color and um, it's named Chrysocus asclepiadeus, uh, which is uh, an active defoliator and the larvae uh, overwinter on the root system. And can, can, they can also destroy all the root system of one single plant. It's only reported from Vincitoxicum, from the literature, and uh, it likes open habitats and sunny pastures. Uh, it's been reported um, in most of the country in France, but also in Central Europe and, and Ukraine. Every year, we observe the peak population in late June. Um, here we conducted in 2019, uh, almost every year, the same kind of uh, uh, collection methods by uh, um, collecting for 30 minutes all the beetles we can find in the, in the prairie. And there is only one single generation per year and the big insect density can be locally observed, like on the picture right here, uh, on, on the plants. And the region where we are going for uh, collecting is in the Jura region next to Switzerland. There is a um, well, kind of conflict of interest or a major concern, I should say, uh, for our project is that swallowworts are closely related to milkworts, like Asclepia syriaca, which is a, a natural host for the monarch butterfly. And in a previous no choice test in laboratory conditions, we showed that Chrysocus may feed on, the, on milkweed. So in that regard, uh, we conducted an open field test near Lyon, which is in, uh, in central uh, France, at about three hours driving from Montpellier, to see when this beetle is released, whether or not Chrysocus will be attracted by uh, milkweeds. Luckily in France, the beetle and the plants, including milkweeds and, and swallowworts, are all present. So no need to work in a quarantine greenhouse. We then installed uh, three different gardens on this big land, as you can see on this slide. And each garden was uh, composed of 10 plants of one single species. So either white swallowwort or pale swallowwort or common milkweed along the, the perimeter of a one meter radius. We then released 20 couples of Chrysocus at the center of each garden, usually at the end of June, when there is a peak population of Chrysocus in Jura. And we'll let the beetles move freely over the next five weeks. And uh, of course, every week we've been there for uh, canting and making observations. As a first result, the beetles were uh, only observed on leaves and stems on milkweed on the first day after release. And then for the next four to five weeks, we haven't seen any adults on any, uh, any of the 10 plants uh, of the circle of the garden. Uh, it was pretty much different, as you can see on the slide, with the bars, the blue bars and the red bars. Uh, for Vincitoxicum rossicum and Erundinaria, which are the host plants. In terms of damage on the foliage, um, we use a scoring system for the damage from zero to four, so zero, no impact, and four, complete defoliation. 
The score two more or less represents 50% defoliation, which was almost reported only for swallowwort. The, um, and nothing for milkweed, zero damage over the five weeks of, uh, of observation. So the next step of uh, this work is um, to evaluate presence and absence of larvae on the root system by taking from the field all the pots with the, the 30 different plants that we have stored uh, at our lab outside. And uh, in this period, in November, we are just, uh, we are just um, removing all the soil from the plants to count the larvae that we will put back into the soil, into the pot. And by May, June next year, we will check the emergence of any adult from every single uh, pot. So more to come. The second target is uh, French broom, uh, which is mostly invasive on the west coast of the US. Uh, as you can see on the, on the map below. French broom negatively impact the native flora, uh, like here next to the Golden Gate Bridge. And I have a collaboration with my colleague, uh, colleague uh, Gaylord de Zermo at EBCL, also uh, next door at CA Cyro, and uh, our partners uh, at ARS Albany. So, um, we have currently in hands two promising biocontrol candidates. Um, on the left hand side, we have the French broom weevil, Lepidapion argentatum, which belongs to the family Brentidae. Uh, and uh, the French broom psyllid, Aretinus acani. In total, um, CA Cyro and the USDA uh, 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 have found about 28 different natural enemies on French broom in all the Mediterranean basin, which is the native range of French broom, as you can see on, on the map on the left. And um, definitely uh, Lepidium argentatum, the, the weevil, was the first studied and turned to be a, a very valuable candidate. It is also very common uh, in southern French, which uh, facilitates a lot of my life as a researcher because uh, we don't have to work in a quarantine. We use this kind of um, uh, umbrella, as we call it, the Japanese umbrella, uh, in which we're beating the plants, and then we get uh, all the adults on the on the sheet, and then we can collect them easily. But um, the next step is to uh, identify males from females, and there is some interesting characters, like here the sexual dimorphism, as you can see on the rostrum, uh, the nose. And uh, for, uh, for males, the nose is, is um, fairly short and yellow-orange, and for females, it's a bit longer and, and black. Interestingly, the, um, the, when we started to, to get interest on, on this swivel, uh, we couldn't really understand the reproductive strategy. And it took a couple of years to see how it worked uh, clearly in the field and in the lab, uh, because there is a dual, a dual strategy for reproduction for this um, uh, swivel. In fact, um, uh, the females, depending on the season, uh, lay their eggs either in the stems, so inducing uh, galls, as you can see on the pic, or in seed pods, inducing seed predation by larvae. As a result, there is a dual impact uh, on the fitness of the plant, of the target. And uh, that was the, the main purpose of this uh, publication in Biocontrol Science and Technology in 2019. We also studied the natural life cycle of the weevil over the year, but here I'm just presenting from February to September, because uh, as you may imagine, the threshold is pretty much the same during uh, uh, October till, uh, till, uh, till January. So it shows that there are, there are two peak populations, one in late June, uh, representing adults emerging from stem galls, and uh, a second peak um, in mid and late July, representing adults emerging from seed pods. And this peak is, is a little bit bigger than the, the first one. 
these field data were uh, confirmed by this other experiment, representing the total number of larvae, nymphs, and adults that were collected from 100 seed pods per date of collection from April to August. And we see that larvae were present until late June and there were just a few in early uh, July. So the majority of adult weevils were emerging from seed pods by mid-July, which fits completely or it matches completely with the data that we got um, from the, the bidding protocol in the field. On the slide, you can see an example of a seed pod with mature seeds uh, in, in green surrounding a consumed seed uh, by a weevil larva. You may get three to four larvae feeding in one single seed pod in some cases. On this picture, you can see an adult weevil emerging. So you see the hole starting from this, this tiny hole in the center of the seed pod and then emerging from the seed pod um, in, in, late, uh, in late June, early July. In parallel to the, to the biological studies, we conducted the, since 2015 uh, no-strange testing with 32 plant species. The biggest damage that uh, we measured, I mean defoliation on the plants, occurred on six broom species that are all non-native to the US. And unfortunately, two closely related uh, species, lupins, were also partially impacted with uh, stem galls uh, observed uh, uh, on the plant. It was a, a non-target effect. And so we, we, we repeated the, the test with those two lupins um, in 2017 and 2021 for Camisonis and Lupinus arboreus, and we didn't get any galls during those two tests, additional tests, which leads to the conclusion that, well, this weevil remains uh, in the pipeline as a good candidate for the future. So um, I will probably duplicate those data experiments next year uh, for making sure that we have enough data for submitting a petition. We also have the second candidate uh, on French broom, which is a psyllid, very nice psyllid, um, which was uh, accidentally released from Europe to South Australia. As you can see on the two pictures uh, down there, uh, before release and two years after release, um, this psyllid population um, was responsible for a big negative impact on French broom. But unfortunately, it can be the same process for the U.S. because uh, in the U.S. we have a lot of endemic lupins, especially in California. So we have to verify and guarantee a zero impact from this uh, psyllid. This is uh, why uh, with Gillard we we conducted and we designed um, uh, an interesting experiment in the field next door with two concentric circles of five and 10 meter radius. On each perimeter, uh, we randomly display 30 plants, so 60 plants total, including Californian lupins, based on an authorization from the French government, of course, and for growing those plants outside, plus French broom control, and five replicates each. Then we released uh, androids of psyllids in the center and we followed the spread of the insects uh, over two months. Unfortunately, I don't have the results yet um, because uh, we didn't analyze the data. Uh, but if you, uh, if you can make uh, the trip to California in April, there will, there will probably be data presented uh, at the W4185. My last example for today is uh, <clears throat> regarding uh, Medusa head. So foreign exploration and biocontrol with my colleagues from EBCL in France and Greece, and my two colleagues from Rome, Francesca and Massimo. Uh, it's, uh, it's a grass, it's, um, it's, it's close to rye, barley, oat and, and wheat. And Medusa head has three subspecies in Eurasia, which look very similar, as you can notice here. 
But as far uh, as uh, as I know, uh, only the subspecies Asprum is invasive in North America. This project is very tricky because of the close relationships with cereal crops. So any biocontrol candidate that we may find during our foreign exploration in Eurasia must be highly specific to the target. This picture represents a slope along an highway that goes here into Turkey. So about 10K, 10K from the Turkish border in Eastern Greece where a few patches of medusaid subspecies crinitum were surveyed in uh, 2017, uh, 2018, and 2019. And uh, all the team uh, has been collected um, uh, green medusaid plants with some galls on the stems. Medusaid has only one stem usually, and in, on one stem you, you have uh, multiple seeds. And here you can get up to five or six galls per stem in lieu of seeds. When uh, we dissected uh, the galls, uh, we noticed the presence of larvae, uh, the larvae from two wasp species belonging to the family Eurytomidae. It's a new finding. And um, one is named Titramisa and the second is Eurytoma. So the Eurytoma species found in galls is most likely a parasitoid of Titramisa, which is the biocontrol candidate for, for this project. Here is a, a very nice picture taken from the article published uh, this year uh, of Titramisa amica, which is new to science and collected for, by, uh, by Francesca over the last uh, three years. Um, it's good news. It's very, very good news after years of uh, foreign exploration on Medusa. Um, and uh, Tetramesa species are very well known uh, as, make, as they make galls on Poesi. Next step will be to test this um, uh, gall wasp on, on uh, a set of 30 different grasses. So we need to get this. So I may interact with some of you in the, in the coming month. And most likely the host range testing for this project will be conducted either in our quarantine in Montpellier or in our substation in Greece. Uh, finally, to conclude, I would say, I would like to say that I'm extremely happy to announce that uh, we started again to travel after almost two years of uh, pandemics. And so I've been to Cyprus, Italy lately and going to Malta in two weeks. So uh, we're back to business. And thank you and merci for your attention. All right, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Sferza. Um, there's a question about uh, the swallowwort um, program you were, you were presenting on and uh, the concerns about non-target impacts on milkweed. And um, the hypena moth was released for swallowwort biocontrol. And there were also some concerns um, that were relieved about the um, impacts to monarch. And I, are these impacts uh, similar to what was shown for that biocontrol agent? Um, how do you feel about that risk profile? Well, um, well, maybe Harriet should answer to that question because they they were involved in the introduction uh, into Canada for IPNA. But um, in that case, um, I think the, um, the story is a bit different. Um, the adult is, is a defoliator, so uh, actively fitting on, on the foliage, and it does nothing so far, uh, based on our data, on the foliage of milkweeds. I mean, on uh, Sciariaca, Asclepias Sciariaca, and I didn't present the data, but also on Asclepias um, tuberosa, another milkweed. Regarding the larval impact um, underground, it's probably a little bit different. Um, we we didn't get yet the data, so I, I cannot really answer. Um, but uh, for sure, if if the the larval development on the root system of milkweed gets to uh, the emergence of an adult, uh, that that'll be another story, and that'll be a bit complicated, of course, for getting a petition approved. Um, if we get that in our uh, lab testing, um, we'll, we'll make sure that. Uh, uh, if we can get a couple or a, a bunch of couples to make them reproduce 
uh, and then sustain a population on, milk, on milkweed in the lab to see uh, uh, if it works. But um, I cannot really answer for now uh, regarding the comparison between uh, swallow worked with Ipina and swallow worked with, uh, uh, with Chrysopus. They, they, they are different system. It's a beetle uh, versus a Lepidoptera. Well, great. Thank you so much again. And I'm going to kick it back to Melissa to uh, invite the next speaker. My pleasure. Bye. Yeah, thank you so much, Renee and Wade. So our next speaker is Massimo Cristofaro with the Biotechnology and Biological Control Agency in Italy. So I welcome you to start sharing your screen, Massimo. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, everybody, for giving to BBCA this uh, wonderful opportunity to attend uh, this uh, summit. And I'm going to present uh, what uh, BBCA have done uh, during uh, last year, last years, on biological control of weeds. Differently from what uh, has been presented by the two uh, previous speakers, uh, BBCA is a very small entity. We are a non-profit company, but uh, just uh, six people are involved. And uh, we are not small only in terms of staff, we are also small in terms of uh, uh, laboratory space. So our facilities are an office lab that you can see on the, on the first uh, picture, about uh, 100 square meters. We have another 100, 150 square meters in, in uh, the large greenhouse that uh, is our greenhouse. But uh, let's say that uh, what we really like a lot is the lot of open space that we have around because um, one of the main uh, um, point of force of BBCA is to perform open field test. As already has been described by uh, Ariet and Rene before, Open field tests are extremely important to have a, a very good idea about the host range of the potential candidate agents. In terms of budget, we are relatively small, and so generally, the annual budget is about 270,000 US dollars, and 61% is for the salaries, 20% is for the travels, and the remaining is for all of the other things. I don't want to speak uh, about money, but it's uh, just a matter to give you an idea that uh, what is interesting, these are the 21 years that uh, BBCA is, uh, is, is exist. We were, we received money from mainly from a USDA or SBCL, but also from different donors. Uh, but uh, what is interesting is that the number of projects here in the year 2004 were about two and there was going uh, climbing up and uh, and now only you we can get enough money having 20 projects so it means a lot of work for us those are the 19 projects on biological control of weeds on which we are involved and uh, and for the people that are not familiar on what we are doing on the other part of the world, <laughs> biological control of weeds, the screening uh, uh, that is uh, somehow is uh, showing this uh, in this kind of uh, table that is, uh, you should consider this, uh, this chart like uh, a, a, a traffic light from red to green. So the beginning, Having a new target weed, we have to start with the, the, the literature surveys in order to find the, the, let's say, the area of origin of the, the plant. Once we have this, this information, we can finally start the field surveys in the areas of origin, collecting the material, performing the, the identification, and making a kind of... Uh, priority list on what can be potentially a good candidate. After that, we can finally move to the host specificity test, evaluating the impact, the risk assessment, and so on. And more recently, this means that in the past 15 years, a lot of biomolecular work is also carried out. 
And finally, when everything is, is uh, I mean, it's fine, that means uh, generally mm, nothing, I mean, less than four or five years, we can have uh, the insect uh, sent to the US quarantine for the final studies. And if everything is done, finally, the insect can be petitioned and released in the US. So very, very long work. And all of this work with all of this, uh, I mean, on the 19 uh, target weeds, of course, uh, is not possible for just six people. So we need uh, somehow to have the cooperation. So it's from the beginning, our nonprofit company, BBCA, was not only a, 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 a private institution, but was more a network. Impossible to do all the work without the, the, the economic, but mainly the scientific support of a lot of cooperators. Somehow, everywhere in the world. So we have, uh, of course, a lot of cooperation in the US. We are cooperating with the four university, of course, with the, the USDA RS uh, laboratories in different kind of different um, in four different states. BLM is important. The CDFA has been very important, uh, and uh, in Europe uh, we have uh, two main uh, operators. Uh, I mean, the USDA or SCBCL and uh, and CABI. But then we also, uh, more recently, we have a wonderful cooperation with uh, with Plovdiv, uh, the Agricultural University of Plovdiv in Bulgaria, and uh, with uh, the, the Foundation Edmund Mack in the northern part of Italy. Asia, different uh, university, and uh, in the, even in Africa, recently, we developed very interesting uh, cooperation with uh, two, two different universities, the Impala Research Center in Kenya. So, of course, again, I don't want to, 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 I mean, to make a huge list of uh, what we have done, uh, what we are doing so far on, in all of these target tweets, but I will focus only on six of them. The first one is uh, Yellow Star Pistol. This, the work that I'm presenting uh, was an incorporation with the Lincoln Smith of the USDRS, uh, the Albany Laboratory in California, with the USDA or SCBCL, uh, two different laboratories in France and Greece, and with the University of Plovdiv in Bulgaria. So most of the, my time in the past <laughs> has been spent on, uh, on this small weevil on the left. It looks very big, but actually is maybe uh, three millimeters, four millimeters long. But it's a very good root boring. And it's attacking the plant at the early stage, of the rosette stage. The other one on the right is still a weevil is a Larinus filiformis, is a seed feeder, excellent seed feeder. You, uh, you can have one larva in, uh, in, the, the, of the, this, in the seed head and one larva is, killing, is destroying all of the seeds that are presenting there. So for the first one, after several studies in Turkey, finally we made the final uh, huge uh, open field test in Italy, where at the BBCA facilities, when we somehow simulate uh, an, a kind of a crop uh, field, a crop, <clears throat> having 1,000 of flower plants versus only 20 YST plants, we release uh, just uh, 10 couples of the weevil, and we check the results. On the other side, the, the, this is the, the open field test that was carried out in Greece, uh, the European Biological Control uh, Facilities in Thessaloniki, uh, with uh, 12 species replicated 10 times. <clears throat> and the uh, first very close to the to the release point so now has been approved for release and it's two years that uh, they are the the scientists Lincoln Smith and other people are trying to release the and and, and to have established the weevil in uh, in, uh, in different parts of uh, of the of the US and we are keep uh, going and collecting material and providing the material to our colleagues 
On the other side, if the open field test was moved from Thessaloniki to Plovdiv, Bulgaria, but unfortunately there the situation with COVID uh, was very, very complicated and it's still quite complicated. So everything is postponed at least for another year. You are very close also there with, uh, with the, the final result. The, the weevil, Larinus filiformis, is very, very promising. And, but we need to, uh, you know, to synchronize uh, somehow the, the flower, the blooming uh, I mean, between different plant species, and it's a little bit complicated. So hopefully soon uh, everything will be finished. The next project uh, is the Russian skeleton weed. <clears throat> The work with this plant was done with, in cooperation with the Russian Academy of Science under the supervision of uh, three people of the U.S., Jeff Littlefield of the Montana State University, Max Schwarzlander of the University of Idaho, and Joe Milan of the BLM. The plant uh, is an Asteraceae, and what we found are I mean, what we are pushing and we are trying to finish as soon as possible two different uh, root boring uh, <clears throat> agents. One is a Lepidoptera, is a moth. Operopsama, please don't ask me to pronounce the species name, and the which are is doing an interesting damage, and uh, we call we found a very good population uh, in a in a black desert in Armenia, east of Turkey. And the second one is uh, in Kazakhstan, is a buprested. The, what is interesting is that uh, the, when the, the larva is inside of the root, is making this kind of a huge goal around the root. And, uh, and then when the, the pupa start to be formed, all the upper part is completely dry out. Most of the work in the field has been done by this wild man on the, the top, Mark Volkovich, and the, the laboratory work mainly was uh, carried out by his wife, uh, Rita Dolboskaya, excellent scientist, both of them. And then let's move to Eilan, to Saltissima. This is... Uh, so for the beginning, it was very interesting because of this plant, is a kind of a, a kind of a universal uh, weed. You can find that this plant as weed in all the five continents. So except China is a, I mean everywhere is a, is very nasty weed. And for this reason, we decided to develop uh, a huge consortium involving uh, USDA, Agricultural Canada, CABI. Uh, EBCL, uh, to, uh, an university in Italy, an university in Serbia, and of course, uh, I mean, BBC ourselves. The, the beginning, I was, uh, everything started uh, maybe five years ago when I was uh, stepping, uh, going out from, uh, from the metro station on a plant, because of, uh, and the, this plant is occurring on the sidewalk. And I said, uh, I was always uh, said to myself, uh, there is nothing that is damaged in this plant. There's nothing that is damaged in this plant. And then I said, oh, there is something. And there were some leaves that, that they were attacked. I, I recorded that somehow I had a feeling that there was an aerophyte mite because the damage was very typical for uh, this kind of uh, arthropod. I sent uh, the material to, to Enrico De Lillo, which is the taxonomy scientist working on aerophyte mites in Italy. And he said, Bingo, bravo, congratulations, you got the mite. And so we made uh, the, the first uh, paper on the, this new aerophyd mite species uh, for Italy. It was not uh, the, first, uh, the first time because of the, the same mite as was uh, already described in Hungary a few years before. But anyhow, it was very promising. The damage was very interesting. And for this reason, we decided to continue to do for two years in a row a very interesting open field test at uh, BBCA facilities. It was 2019 and 2020. Just uh, a short note, for 2020, last year, Italy was really in lockdown, completely locked down. So we were somehow trapped at home for more than two or three months. 
finally, when they decide to open, the, to, to give us some freedom, the, there was for more than, uh, than a month, there was a possibility just to travel into the town where we were living, not more. And uh, since the mite was very common, very close to the lab, for us it was possible to perform the second year of uh, open field test that uh, Francesca did in a very excellent way with uh, a student. So the results uh, testing uh, 13 test plants were uh, extremely good. So no side of no effects uh, of the mite on the other plants. The mite was able to survive uh, for uh, a relatively long, uh, like more than one month or two months in uh, a couple of cases on, uh, on, on, the, on plants outside of, uh, of, I mean, different from Ailantus altissima, but uh, the number were always declining, declining. So at the end, uh, when we harvest uh, after 60 days, uh, you can see that uh, the numbers that we found uh, on uh, Ailantus altissima were huge compared to zero or 0 0.5 of the, on the mites that we found on Ole Europe Asia and Olive Tree and, uh, and uh, Rus uh, Joriaca. The, in the, the, the big difference is that uh, those mites are dying at the end and uh, they the were just the remaining of the beginning of the, of, uh, of the population because we somehow infested the, each plant on, with the mites. So they were able somehow to starving and surviving. For Alantus altissima, there was a huge increase of the population with a big impact on the plant, so a lot of damage. So this is on the left, the plant uh, healthy, and this is the damage that you can find, but can be even more than this. So somehow, so sometimes the, the leaves are, are so different uh, that it is difficult to recognize that uh, the, the leaf is belonging from, from the plant. You think that is a different species. What is interesting with this mite is that this uh, prefer to attack uh, the, the plant when it's small. So, or at the seedling level, when the plant maybe is uh, not really seedling, actually uh, one meter, or the shoots that are coming out uh, from the root system. So it somehow can be used to control not the big trees, but uh, some, somehow the expansion of the plant with the new seeds, I mean, the new seedlings, or, I mean, other plants that are coming from asexual activities. So we decided to start this year to do some impact studies at the beginning with the, the plants from the seeds. And this is the plant on the left that is not inoculated. And this is the, the same plant two months later after inoculation. You can see the damage. We don't know yet if this plant will survive or not. This will be solved next year when we are going, because in this moment, the plant is without leaves. And we will see at the end of the winter if the plant will be able to survive. What is interesting to know for this mite is the attack is not limited only to the leaves in this, in, in, during the summer, because when the leaf is dropped, all the mites, all the females of the mites are into the stem and they are not uh, relaxing. They are still doing their business, so very damaging. And uh, at the end, this is the result that you can get. So the, the, the shoot somehow is, is killed, is destroyed. And uh, eventually this, this, uh, the small green uh, 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 young leaves that are coming out from, uh, from the leaf buds, I don't know if they, they survive for, the, for that year, but for sure they will not survive in the next. So the impact is very, very important on the, on the young tree or young stages of the tree. Genetic is also start to be involved. So this is distribution of Elantus altissima. The, the gray part is indicating in China, the area of origin, and the, the green parts are indicating the place uh, where the plant is invasive. And this is distribution of Aculus mosoniensis, the species that we found in Italy. 
is also present as has been described in uh, in china and also described in different countries uh, in europe what uh, is also interesting is that um, the situation is a little bit more complicated because also in the us in the eastern part of the us you have another aculus aculus ailanti which, which is also somehow uh, connected with the same target with and is doing the same kind of damage. Actually, most probably, according to Enrico De Lillo, the taxonomist, but also the, 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 the my taxonomist in the US, they are the same species. So we need to decide. So at the end, at the end we have to do a lot of genetic work to redescribe everything and to, to in order to figure out uh, the name of which will, uh, will be Aculus Mosoniensis or Aculus Silanti or however, something different. But uh, with the material that we have uh, in Europe, we got in Europe, the, the, the people, that, the, bio, the biomolecular people that receive material from us that were collecting I mean, leaf samples infested with mites uh, everywhere, they find out that there are that actually the mite uh, is still Aculus mosoniensis, but the genetic so morphologically is Aculus mosoniensis, but there are three different entities that have uh, some kind of distance. So there is a, a big group that uh, somehow similar to what I found at the, at the beginning in Italy and Rome, and the, uh, and that is as most of uh, the entities that uh, have been found in other on in other countries while in Austria Slovenia there is another entity and in uh, Apulia Bari alone a, a different one again so something that will be published very soon and uh, most of the work, the genetic work has been done by Mary Claude Bonn of uh, EBCL and uh, Tatiana, anyhow, a scientist from the uh, from um, the University of Belgrade, Serbia. This plant, just to finish, uh, is not only important uh, for the I mean, because an impacting uh, an invasive species, but also because. Uh, is a very important substrate, uh, biological support for two very important pests. So we are trying to understand if the mite uh, can play an important role in the at the different trophic level, also um, on the fitness of brown marmorous sting bug and spotted lanternflies that are very important pests. Finally. This year we started to study the biology and, um, and we, are, um, we have an idea if COVID will allow us to do, to, have, uh, to improve the ostrich test, including also species that are important from US and Canada. So far we were, since the, since the, the plant is very important for all the countries, I was starting with the plants that are very important that uh, were close by in uh, to our laboratory in Rome. <clears throat> and then awesome. the last no. I... so for Bramus tectarum uh, cheatgrass, we have the cooperation with uh, CABI, with the University of Belgrade, with the USERS Nevada, and with the EBCL France. And uh, recently, uh, uh, a project has been approved. Has been approved to evaluate uh, somehow the the biogeographic contrast uh, influencing the, these invasive species uh, in the native versus non-native ranges. Somehow the evaluation should be comparing uh, what are the effects, uh, the biotic effects, and the uh, abiotic effects. So biotic, of, of course, will be plants, insect herbivory, cattle grazing, and fire uh, mechanical damage for the abiotic. But uh, this is just the beginning. But we also found uh, inter interesting material on this uh, on this plant. And uh, the first one, again, is a mite, is a new species, it's called Aculodes marcelli, and uh, has been found uh, in two different localities, and uh, 
we are publishing a paper at the beginning of 2022. And uh, of course, we are going to do an impact evaluation before to do the host range evaluation because we are not sure that the impact will be so important. But at the same time, we found an interesting major that is damaging, uh, is, a, is, a, is a making goals in the seeds. And it's a new species of stenodiplosis uh, has been recently published. And, uh, and finally, in, this, at the, in one of the same place where we found the midge in Greece, a very beautiful place, so we also find the weevil that is a, is a, is a, a seed feeder. And so we are going to continue the work on this species. For Teniatenum caput medusa, I, I can stop because uh, everything was already discussed and presented by uh, René Sforza. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Massimo. I really appreciate it. There's lots of great information there. I'm sorry we had to kind of rush you through the end. Our next presenter is Ian Patterson with the Center for Biological Control uh, with Rhodes University in South Africa. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everyone. I'm Ian Patterson from the Center for Biological Control at Rhodes University, and I'm talking to you from a little town called Makanda in the Eastern Cape province of South Africa. And I'm just going to chat about some of the um, uh, weed biological control collaborations between the Center for Biological Control, or the CBC, and a variety of different institutes uh, in North America. I'm going to start by talking about a couple of examples where we are working on plants that are invasive in North America and uh, are indigenous in South Africa, and we are looking for biocontrol agents here. Then I'm going to give a few examples of the reciprocal, so biological control agents that we will be sourcing from North America, where the plants are indigenous, to control invasive alien plants in South Africa. And I will then end by talking about a few examples of mutual weeds to both regions where the weeds are of origin elsewhere in the world, but because both regions have biocontrol programs, we can collaborate um, with mutual benefits. So just to start with a little bit of history, the first um, exchange of biological control agents between South Africa and North America actually happened quite a long time ago. Um, the first ever South African agent to be released in North America was released in the USA, in Hawaii, in fact. And it was a snout weevil um, released against Rumex, and that was way back in 1957. It wasn't long after that that the first North American um, uh, biological control agent was released in South Africa for the control of an invasive alien plant. And that was the noctured moth that was released against Antana Camara back in 1962. Um, but since then, there hasn't been as much activity as one would expect. There's actually in total only been two agents that came from South Africa that have ever been released in North America. So there's only ever been one more since 1957. And there's been 17 agents that have been uh, sourced in North America that have been released in South Africa. So there's definitely scope for a lot more, especially in getting South African biological control agents um, released in North America to control um, alien invasive plants there. So the first um, uh, example that I'm going to talk about is crystalline ice plant or cryophyton crystallinum. Um, this is a, a plant that gets its name from the massively enlarged bladder cells that you can see on the calyx of the flower in the photograph on the right. These bladder cells actually cover the whole plant and they are packed full of a hypersaline solution. So um, crystalline ice plant is a halophyte and it accumulates salt from the area um, where it grows. And um, it's also an annual. And when it dies, it leaches the salt back into the topsoil. Because it's a halophyte, its seeds can survive and thrive in that very um, saline um, topsoil. But nearly all other plants cannot survive in it. So this is a plant that changes its habitat in order to um, uh, make the, the habitat a, a better place for its progeny. And it's kind of an ecosystem engineer. And you can imagine how problematic this is uh, where the plant is invasive. Um, as I said, it is indigenous to southern Africa. Uh, it's found along the west coast of South Africa and in um, southern Namibia. And it is very problematic in California and the islands offshore California and in Mexico. Um, 
This is a photograph of an infestation on an offshore island um, um, off the coast of California. Everything that you can see in that photograph is um, crystalline ice plant. And you can just imagine the massive impacts this is having to indigenous biodiversity and ecosystem functioning on the island. These islands are also very special places. And um, there's a whole lot of endemic plants and even endemic mammals uh, that, that, are, that are only found on these islands and are, are directly threatened by this invasion. Um, and it's for that reason that Dr. Patrick Moran of the USDA initiated a project to work on this problem. Um, and he has thankfully got us um, at uh, the CBC involved in working on it, which I'm very grateful for. Um, so this is a photograph of a typical ice plant site in South Africa. Um, obviously very different from what we see in California. We never ever get those dense monocultures of the plant in South Africa. If you look in the foreground of this photograph, you can see there's a couple of little ice plants dotted around, um, and that's the typical situation. And everyone at this forum will know that the reason for that is because there's a whole lot of natural enemies associated with it. So this is quite a new project, and we've recently just started looking for um, natural enemies associated with this plant that could be potential biological control agents. So far, we've found um, a whole lot of different insects, but the two most promising ones are two species of weevil. One is a lixus weevil and one is a calademus weevil. The lixus weevil is a stem mining weevil and that's um, the one that you can see in the photographs below. Uh, it mines the stems of the plant, it eats the vascular tissue and um, is, is in fact a, a very damaging um, little insect. The calademus weevil is a root girdling weevil so the larvae are free living um, in the soil and they feed on the, the smaller roots when they are small larvae and then as they get bigger, they actually girdle the whole taproot and then they um, make a little pupation chamber in the side of the, of the taproot where they pupate and the adults then feed on the leaves of the plant. Um, so both of these insects are very, very damaging to crystalline ice plants. They also have only ever been recorded um, on the, the target weed and on two very close relatives, um, which are, are congeners. So, Outside of the genus Cryophyton, there are, there are six species of Cryophyton in su Southern Africa. Um, and this insect, these, both of these insects have been found on three of them and have never been recorded on anything else. And that's obviously um, very promising in terms of their host specificity. Also promising for host specificity is that the family that crystalline ice plant comes from, the Azoaceae, is extremely diverse in Southern Africa but there's only a handful of species that are found outside of that region. So there's only a, a couple of species in North America that are in the family, the same family as this target weed. So we really think that there's a good chance that both of these agents, uh, of these natural enemies, will be suitably host-specific um, for release. At the moment, what the CBC is doing is we are conducting preliminary host-specificity testing using the Lixus weevil. Um, so far, things are looking very promising from what we've done. And if everything goes according to plan and the natural enemy seems like it's going to be suitably host specific, it will be sent to um, the USDA where Dr. Patrick Moran will, will lead a, a project to um, do more detailed host specificity testing. And we plan on doing that with the Calademus weevil next. Another very new and very exciting project that we have just started working on, or in fact are going to start working on on the 1st of January next year, um, is a guinea grass or Megathrysis maximus. This is a plant that is uh, very widespread in sub-Saharan Africa where it is valued for its grazing, um, but it's become extremely uh, invasive in Texas. You can see from those two photos at the bottom, which were taken in Texas, that large monocultures of this plant are, are forming in that area. And you can just imagine the, the negative impacts to the functioning of that ecosystem. There's also a species of quail um, that is directly threatened. It's losing its habitat because of the invasion of this grass. There are two forms of the grass that occur in both Texas and in Southern Africa. There's a large form and a smaller form. The, the large form um, is very valued for grazing, whereas the smaller form is the one that is um, considered invasive in Texas. And it is the smaller form of the plant um, that we are targeting for biological control. And these two forms of the plant are distinct genetically. Um, so this is work that we um, are about to start in collaboration with the um, University of Texas. So far, we've just done some preliminary surveys and um, what we've found has been very interesting. Um, Rene was talking about a Tetramesa species that um, they had found on a grass. We've also found a Tetramesa species on guinea grass. 
as you can see from the, the name on the photograph on the left, we have had some help from our colleagues at the BBCA who have done a bit of work on the species for the USDA in the past. Um, but having a Tetramisa species on this plant as a potential biocontrol agent is very exciting. Tetramisa has been used as a biocontrol agent for Arundodonax successfully um, in the USA, uh, and they are likely to be very host specific. So this is going to be one of the first insects that we do host specificity testing on, um, hopefully starting in January next year. We have also found other stuff on guinea grass. We found a very interesting um, which forms these hairy galls that you can see on the stems of the plant. Um, the galls individually aren't particularly damaging. They do do a little bit of damage. Um, but one very interesting thing is that 99% of the galls are parasitized by um, parasitoid wasps. So one can only imagine how abundant this cecidomyid could become um, if it was released from that um, um, parasitism. And we've also found uh, scale insects feeding on the roots of the plant. So, the CBC intends to uh, do all the host specificity testing necessary for this um, project here in South Africa in our, um, um, at our facility in, in Makanda. And any plants that um, we do not have here that we need to get from Texas, we will keep in our quarantine facility and we'll conduct the host specificity testing there. Whereas many of the plants that are available in South Africa, we could conduct either in or outside of the quarantine. Cape Ivy is a much more um, well-established project. This is something that the USDA has been working on um, since the 1980s. Um, Patrick Moran at, at this point is, is leading the, the, the project. Uh, it is a plant that's again indigenous in South Africa, found mostly in the Eastern Cape and the Western Cape of South Africa, and is majorly problematic in California. And a variety of different institutes in South Africa have worked um, on looking for biological control agents for Deliria odorata um, over this period of time. The photograph um, on the top right shows the galls of the fruit fly, um, which has already been released and is established at some sites in California. You can see on that, that um, gall that there's a small window where the um, larvae has made a window so that when it closes as an adult, it will be able to get out of that big fleshy gall. Um, but there's still a need for other biological control agents for this plant. Um, so the USDA is working on a moth called Digiti vulva. The photograph on the bottom right is the damage that Digiti vulva does to the plant. It mines in the, the leaves um, of the plant. And at this very moment, um, we have a team um, from the um, CBC who are down in the Western Cape of South Africa collecting Digiti vulva to send um, to the USDA in, in Albany um, to do more work on that species. So moving on to a few plants that are indigenous in North America and problematic in South Africa. Um, Engelmann's prickly pear or Apuntia Engelmannii is indigenous across the whole of the Southern USA and well into Mexico. And it's become very invasive in large parts of Africa, including South Africa and Kenya. Uh, this species is a very complicated species with a huge amount of um, intra-specific diversity. Some authors have um, divided it up into 17 different intraspecific varieties of the plant. So it is um, quite a difficult target to work on. Um, in South Africa, we have at least two different varieties of the plant, both very problematic. And in Kenya, there's another variety of the plant that is extremely problematic. The photograph that you can see there was taken in Texas, and you can see that it is absolutely covered in cochineal insects. Uh, cochineal insects have been very successful at controlling a pontioid species elsewhere um, in South Africa, in Australia, all over the world. Um, so this was a very obvious um, uh, group of insects to target um, for potential biocontrol agents. Um, so 10 different lineages comprising of two species of cochineal were collected in the southern USA, um, and they were imported into South Africa into the Witts University quarantine facility in Johannesburg. And they were first tested um, to see whether they were going to be damaging enough on the different varieties of the plant that we have here in Africa. Unfortunately, none of these 10 lineages were sufficiently damaging to our two South African um, varieties of the plant, but one was very damaging to the variety of the plant in Kenya. And I'm very happy to say that within the last um, month or two, th that cochineal was released in Kenya and has established. So hopefully we're gonna start seeing a really good impact on that um, and this really damaging weed in Kenya soon. 
mesquite or prosopis is another huge problem in South Africa. It's a, a, a major problem in our arid areas in the semi-desert area called the Karoo in the center of South Africa and through the Kalahari Desert. Um, from those photographs, you can see in these arid areas that it just grows into dense monocultures and it's a major water user. Its roots are incredibly deep and in such a water scarce area where, where water is a valuable commodity, um, uh, th this is really becoming a, a water security threat. Um, the plant is indigenous to both North and South America and we've released three biocontrol agents so far two sourced from North America, and more recently, in fact, uh, two weeks ago, with the help of our colleagues at Fuedi in Argentina, um, we released a, another biological control agent, a weevil that feeds on the green pods of the plant. So we have a seed feeding weevil a, from, from North America, the new biocontrol agent, which feeds on the, uh, is another weevil that feeds on the green pods, and we have a, a microlepidopteran that defoliates the plant. But we're still looking for more um, biocontrol agents to attack different parts of the plant and we've started a collaboration with um, New Mexico State University to look for biocontrol agents that attack the roots, the stems, and we're particularly looking at galling and um, scale insects. Nymphaea mexicana or the yellow water lily um, is indigenous in Florida, Louisiana, Texas and, and Mexico and it is seriously invasive in South Africa. Um, using another uh, set of photos, one from the indigenous range and one from the, the invaded range again to just illustrate how different these plants grow in the different areas. The photograph on the left is obviously within the indigenous range and you can see there's gaps between the water lily pads and light is, can easily penetrate into the water column. Whereas in the photograph on the right, that's a typical invasion in South Africa, the pads are overlapping from each other. It actually builds biomass up so that the plant kind of leaves the water and you can imagine that uh, the, the whole aquatic ecosystem is completely destroyed by this and no light can penetrate um, through this layer of the plant. Um, our, with uh, collaboration with uh, Florida University and Louisiana State University, um, as well as the USDA, two potential biological control agents are being considered. They've been imported into quarantine here at the CBC. One is a uh, vagus weevil which feeds on the petioles of the plant and then as an adult will feed on the leaves, the, the pads of the water lily, and Megamelis toddy, which is a, a delphacid that is a sap sucker and feeds on the leaves of the plant. Um, so host specificity testing is going to be conducted on these two uh, natural enemies. And um, so just, just to, to finish off, there are a number of species of joint interest these are plants that do not originate in either North America or South Africa, um, but in this case are, are Brazilian and uh, South American waterweeds. And um, the photograph in your top right, you can see is um, Salvinia molesta, which used to be a major problem in South Africa until it is controlled by the biological control agent, the weevil Certebagus salviniae. But after controlling this plant, we've ended up in a situation where that space has been taken by a new invader, the very similar looking um, Salvinia minima, which is pictured on, on, on the left of your slide. Um, the Certobagus weevil can feed on this plant, but it can't complete its development because it's a different species and it's much smaller. But the, a, a very similar situation had occurred in the USA and our colleagues um, from the USA have provided us with another biotype of that Certobagus weevil that can complete its development on the, the new invasive Salvinia minima. And we've got that in quarantine at the moment and we are trying to fast track it so that we can get it released as quickly as possible to stop um, uh, Salvinia minima from ever becoming as problematic as Salvinia molesta was prior to biological control. We've also done a lot of collaborative work on water hyacinth, for example, the, um, the Delphacid Megamelis scutellaris, which was released in South Africa, the most recent release of a biocontrol agent on water hyacinth, um, was first released in the USA. And then finally, parrot's feather. We heard a bit about parrot's feather in previous talks. Um, Lysathia is a very effective biocontrol agent for parrot's feather here in South Africa. And this plant has become a weed in Canada and the USA recently. Um, so just to finish off, I, um, th there's a huge amount of um, opportunity for collaboration between South Africa and North America for weed biological control and um, many new projects and, and exciting things to work on in the future. And with that, I thank you. Our next presenter, is uh, Willie Cabrera Walsh with the Foundation for Study of Invasive Species in Argentina. 
good day everybody thanks for inviting me to this and uh, i'll be talking mostly about three plants we've worked a lot in the past i'm afraid you've heard about parrot's feather twice already i'll make it brief i'll sprint through it um and why do i say bring back old foes because as i say uh, everybody's worked on these plants for many years in the past but uh, we've had to start working on them again quite recently so a little about our lab it's FUEDE, that's a Spanish acronym for Foundation for the Study of Invasive Species. Our lab was founded in 1962. It was formerly known as the SABCL, the South American Biological Control Lab. It was actually an ARS lab located in Hurlingham. That's a few uh, kilometers, a few miles outside of the city of Buenos Aires in Argentina. We became a foundation in 2012. The lab... Uh, first history in the 60s was was with only, only with weed biocontrol. We started including insect biocontrol in uh, about 1982. We branched out to international collaboration in the 90s. That's when we started working with Australia, South Africa, mostly. And well, we started acquiring basic molecular capabilities maybe six or seven years ago. So what do we do? We do biological control of pests and weeds in Argentina. We start by developing the plan with specificity and damage evaluations, both in the laboratory and in the field. Once we select something that looks good, we just export it to our collaborators in different countries. And every time those agents go through uh, a, a new set of quarantine studies, in this case in the United States, but wherever we ship them. And finally, if we're lucky, if everything goes well, our agents will be released in the field. These are two examples of agents of ours released. The uh, Gratiana Boliviana grains tropical soda apple in Florida and uh, the, some of the decapitating forids against uh, fire ants in Florida too. So these are our current wheat projects. Water firm, Brazilian pepper tree, belly ache. You can read them as well as I can. The ones with the green ticks are the ones that are somehow relevant to the United States. This doesn't mean we're working with them necessarily with the United States, but uh, they're problematic in the States too. In the case of salt cedar here, this is uh, the first time we are actually working for Argentina with America. So we, we are trying to transfer the the project that was so success, successful in the United States to Argentina, where salt cedar is also a very problematic weed. So uh, three of the main aquatic weeds we first studied in the 60s and 70s, one was water hyacinth, Pontederia crassipus, water primroses, at least two species of Ludwigia, one called the creeping Ludwigia, or the creeping water primrose and the floating water primrose, and then parrot's feather, Mirophyllum aquaticum. The thing with these plants is that they're becoming problematic in higher latitudes. So here's a, something we've heard somewhere. So biocontrol is not necessarily a definite solution then, or a definite solution or a, or a, or a stable solution. Well, the thing is agents are still successful where they've established. It's that some plants have moved outside their expected range. Then the spread of subtropical plants into temperate areas can make some agent populations inadequate. And we must be aware that global warming will make this problem more frequent. Plants will escape their natural enemies. So here's the USDA plant heart in a zone map. When we started working with water hyacinth in the 60s, uh, the problem was in southeastern United States, essentially nowadays, Water hyacinth can actually overwinter uh, from zone eight all the way down to 11. So when you're looking at this map in color, all the areas that are actually areas light brown to brown to pink to orange are areas where water hyacinth can actually uh, overwinter now. So that means all up the West Coast, for instance. And they find it, it doesn't overwinter as far north as as uh, Canada, but they find it there every year. So something's going on. And these are the three agents we are concentrating on. There are several others that have been released, but um, these are the ones we're working on again. 
Megamelus scutellaris, uh, Ian just mentioned it. Neocytina, two species of Neocytina that are the big, the big heroes of water hyacinth control all over the world. And we are working on that again. And then there's this little fly, Thriptychus truncatus, a dolicopodid. It's a tiny fly of about just, just over a millimeter. And that hasn't been released anywhere. But as I was saying, um, water hyacinth is showing up in Southern Europe, in the Azores. Even in, it's even becoming a pest, uh, a weed in temperate lakes in Argentina. So it used to be subtropical only up to the Paraná Delta area. And now we're finding it further south. Um, and as I was saying in, in the United States, it, 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 they find it even in Ontario. So the approach for this problem is looking, looking for cool Megamelos and Neocytina. That, that means really Megamelos and Neocytina that uh, from the more temperate, the cold areas. And we are revisiting Thripticus. We are trying to develop uh, reliable lab rearing techniques. It, it is very difficult to rear. Damage evaluation, that's also proven very difficult because the, the, it, the larvae make very small, um, very tiny uh, mines in the, in the leaves, in the petioles. And it has been proven very difficult to, to evaluate the damage. What we do know is that the larvae work, uh, function a bit as a syringe and they introduce plant pathogens into the leaves that otherwise couldn't penetrate. So that's probably the kind of damage we should be evaluating. As for specificity, we have to work on that a little more, but uh, uh, over the years, it's proven to be very, very specific. So Ludwigia, well, there are no agents released for Ludwigia yet anywhere. Um, the thing is in the United States is that we require highly specific natural enemies because there are several species of Ludwigia very close to the invasive ones. So the, the specificity has to go to species level, even probably to subspecies level. So that's, that's a big challenge. Several, we've shipped several insects to America already. A couple of them seem to be really specific, such as spe especially this Lyothrips, the, the thrips we sent some years ago, but it's been discarded. It wasn't specific enough. Pseudolatus bosque was rejected, Lysathia, all these four species have been evaluated already and they've all been rejected. So our hopes now are, are uh, mostly on a, on, a, on a guild of weevils in the genus Tyloderma that specialize in the, let's call it Ludwigia grandiflora and other species, which is the, 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 the name that envelops all the invasive Ludwigias. And they have, there are fruit eaters, tip borers, stem borers. I mean, it's a whole, it's a whole group of 15 to 17 species that attack the plant on a, every flank. And then we have a uh, Pisonotus, that's also a plant hopper. Uh, it's a plant hopper, not a leaf hopper. And uh, which apparently could be specific as well. So here's what we have. Oh, we have this problem too the taxonomy of, of water primroses. Uh, this is supposedly the same species. You can see there's a wide morphological intraspecific variation. So we don't really know what's going on with that. And we're trying to resolve it with molecular tools as well as morphological tools, but uh, there seem to be overlapping hybrids and things like that, which just make, make everything more complicated. So this is the guild of Tylodermas attacking different parts of the plant. And we are aiming at these three first. One is Tylodemon nigrum maculatum, that feeds on fruit. Pisanotus, as I said, a sucker. And Tylodemon natator, it's probably our best shot. It's a stem borer. And uh, I don't know, we have to see how the tests go. But uh, if it's not these, then I'm afraid we're out of bullets. Parrot feather. Uh, Ian already mentioned Lysathia does a hell of a job, but we've known for, for decades now that Lysanotus marginicollis is also pretty specific and quite damaging. The thing is that as Lysathia in South Africa was so damaging, they just uh, stopped studying anything else. They weren't interested in anything else. But that wasn't the case for, for instance, United States or Australia, 
we have uh, we have different several species of native um, uh, of, of native uh, uh, Merophyllum and uh, they were worried Lysathia wasn't specific enough. There's another problem with this with the plant with the the leaf beetle is that it's yet undescribed. We don't really know what it is. When it was first exported, we thought it was one species, but it turns out it isn't. And uh, so our approach now is first, one of the first things is to ID Lysathia from parrot feather and water primrose, because here they're considered the same species. There's a very destructive Lysathia on water primrose, which has just been described as the same species. We are working on molecular studies, reproduction tests, and larval morphology, uh, because we're almost certain there's probably at least four different species that are doing this, and we don't know which is which and what they're doing to whom. Um, and then we'll be concentrating on searching for Listronotus marginicollis, the weevil, adapted to temperate areas. So we're looking for them in northern Patagonia, and we're doing field host range studies on the Mirophyllum species and probable hybrids we have in the south, because we have a, another species of Mirophyllum in the south that may be hybridizing with parrot feather. So why don't biocontrol agents adapt to colder conditions too? Why don't they move with the plants up? Well, to begin with, the agents were selected climatically matched to the invaded areas, mostly to Florida to begin with. And these insects are often devoid of over overwintering strategies. So when the plants disappear with the frost and everything, the insects uh, just can't survive. So on the one hand, the plants may be pre-adapted to colder conditions, and on the other, they can actually come back every spring, probably from seed or from, from buried stolen and things like that. Another thing, too, we must consider is that biodiversity diminishes at higher latitudes. So we often have fewer candidates to choose from when we start working with temperate agents for weeds that were considered or were invasive originally in, um, in neotropical and tropical environments. So here's our list of, of weeds again. And I uh, have to say that vast majority of all classical biocontrol successes have relied on foreign exploration and agents. And this stands true both for classical biocontrol and both for insects and weeds. Uh, in the past, specificity, safety, used to be the only explicit concern when selecting a biocontrol agent. But um, many factors that were addressed sort of intuitively in the past must be address explicitly and experimentally nowadays such as phylogenetics and fine taxonomy we can't be uh, we can't export agents we don't know what they are or there's only one thing anymore yeah, that's something that's not accepted any longer biogeography studies are needed Ge geographical range to make sure that whatever we send will establish where we need it to establish and not anywhere else or if it spreads, where can we expect it to spread? That's very difficult and we usually don't try that, but at least we have to make sure that it establishes we need it. Potential impact, that, those are important studies. Uh, agents have been rejected because the impact seemed not to be uh, strong enough. Field host range studies are very useful. Non-target effects, that's things we need to address as well. And agent compatibility, make sure that two agents or more than two actually can work together so to speak. So what's the advantage of the foreign labs? Um, <clears throat> we can do a, a whole bunch of in situ studies, field studies, uh, field range studies, experiments in garden experiments that uh, if you don't do them in, in the place of origin of the agents, you have to do it in quarantine. So that's a big problem. Uh, all these field studies can minimize the rejection of suitable candidates too, because sometimes the quarantine tests give too many false positives. Sometimes an insect looks bad, but when you do the field studies, it, you realize that it actually is a safe insect. Now, that has happened several times already. Um, then there's a the problem of dealing with local and foreign authorities with uh, uh, adoption of the, of the Nagoya Protocol almost all over the world and in more countries every day, access to biodiversity in different countries has become very, very difficult. And sometimes only local uh, scientists can actually do it. That's the case, for instance, in almost all South America. Um, 
also a foreign lab can travel during different seasons, can spend hours or weeks in the field, can go back and forth, and we can transport unlimited samples to the lab. We can set up experimental plots, we can negotiate with farmers, national park authorities, etc. things that are very difficult if you're only traveling to a country for two weeks looking for a new agent. So the type of cooperation we can have with our collaborators, that is, for instance, US labs with, with foreign labs is, I've divided it into sort of type one, two, and three. Type one is only exploration. You find something interesting, you ship it, you do the literature search, and you send it and let uh, your collaborator do all the lab work in quarantine. The second type is in situ development, where, we, where the foreign lab will do full host range testing, uh, might develop at least basic laboratory rearing techniques, and will do the field host range. And then there's a full cooperation. This is over several years where you can do web studies, you can do the ecology and behavior field impact evaluations. You can do controlled environment impact evaluations, and you can actually, you can even do release studies. And uh, the, these type of cooperation, these three types of cooperation have very different outcomes in productivity. Yeah. Only speaking of publications, with the type one publication, you may get one or two publications out with a type three collaboration. It's in the twenties or more. So I know I'm, I'm blowing my own horn here, but, uh, it, what I mean to say is that uh, when you do, when you get to this kind of collaboration, really, sort of over over a few years, and 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 in the, you really develop a program both in the collaborators lab and in the foreign lab, you the productivity of the projects increases quite a lot. So I think that's another thing you have to keep in mind is that uh, many programs are shared or picked up by other agencies. Most of you probably know, but the weed by control community is a, a big friendly brotherhood that goes essentially all over the world. And uh, when you do a study that isn't really, that probably doesn't produce anything useful for, for somebody, it may be useful to somebody else. This is the case, for instance, for Brazilian water weed, where we started a project with, with the ARS in California. The agent wasn't considered uh, specific enough for California, for the United States, but it was for South Africa. So the agent sort of was in the end released in South Africa. And there's another case here, which went the other way around. We started working first with collaborators in South America. And then we started working with Albany and Cabi in England together. And here's just a number of weeds that are important in the United States that could be added. I'm just putting them for consideration as uh, potential projects of weed by control. I think that's all I have for you. And thank you very much from my team and I. Well, thank you again, Dr. Cabrera-Walsh. Welcome back, everyone. So we are going to move on to our next presentation, and that is from Marcelo Vitorino with the Department of Fo Forestry at the Regional University of Blumenau in Brazil. So welcome, Marcelo. Uh, good morning, uh, good evening, good night. We have many time zones here today. And um, my name is Marcelo Vitorino, I'm from Brazil. And today I want to show you how, uh, how important it was fostering international cooperation uh, here, but also to include Brazil in biological control of weeds. So we need to come back in the past uh, to show uh, how everything starts here. Uh, the University of Paraná in, in the South of Brazil here, uh, has a, a forestry course, and this course is located in the Curitiba city. There are some pictures here from the Curitiba. It's a capital of the state with less than 3 million people, a very nice city. And in the 90s, Dr. Clifford Smith from the University of Hawaii in Manoa was looking for a Brazilian uh, scientist 
interested in start surveys with the natural enemies associated with strawberry guava. Uh, he contacted a uh, weed scientist, Brazilian weed scientist, Dr. Pitelli. Uh, but Pitelli was uh, a weed scientist involving with herbicides. And Pitelli indicated to Cliff uh, and introduced him Dr. Pedroza Macedo from the Federal University of Paraná. So uh, this is the, the beginning of the biological control of weeds uh, in Brazil, uh, Pedroza, and the cooperation with the University of Hawaii. We, during five or six years, we did many surveys in south, southeast, and northeast Brazil, mostly on the coast, looking for the natural enemies associated with strawberry guava. And we selected some, some insects, mainly gulls, like you can see here in the, in the images or photographs. We selected at least three interesting gulls with potential, but just one, this one here, Tectococcus ovatus, the leaf gull was uh, approved to be introduced in Hawaii. The other two gulls are still a potential insects, but the studies was uh, and in, in 96, 97. So uh, this is the insect, the, the leaf gall, Tectococcus ovatus. You can see two galls here. Uh, the bigger gall is a uh, female gall and the smaller one is a male gall. Uh, the male is a hair insect appearing just in the summer. Uh, we can see also the crawlers uh, sucking the leaf and the surface, surface of the leaf and, and the gauze beginning. And also we can see a wax with the eggs that was uh, the, the female produced by Partenogenetico inside the gall and, and the eggs with these wax, are, uh, they are spread by the wind. So the Strawberry Guava project uh, selected this insect and we did some releases, controlled releases uh, in the field uh, to prove that the insect has potential, his damage has potential. And also we, we conduce many host uh, testing, open field host testing here. So you can see how damaged the goals could be all the young leaves uh, are attacked, even uh, young stems, bud flowers, and uh, young fruits are attacked by the gall. And uh, of course, the quantity of galls will decrease the surface area from the leaves and the plant will be stressed. So we can see uh, as a result here that these plants, this is the plants, uh, Really, uh, we have three plants until today they are infested with the Tectococcus ovatus. And these three plants never produce fruits again. So uh, plants are still alive because we have the natural enemies from the, the, the gall maker here, but stressed uh, not flowering, not producing more fruits. So as I told, we conduce open field tests and we have here a picture showing the strawberry guava versus common guava. So uh, two plants from genus Psidium, very close. And you can see that the galls are not present in the common guava. So we tested many Mirtaceae, native Mirtaceae from Brazil and also other plant families. And this insect was uh, uh, introduced to the United States and Firstly, released in July 2012 in Hawaii. So here I have some pictures sent me by Dr. Tracy Johnston uh, showing the release of the insect. You can see uh, is made by a paintbrush, collecting the crawlers or collecting the eggs and releasing on the young leaves to be attacked. Uh, the, the information I had is that this insect is established in some parts of the islands in, in Hawaii and more uh, associated with the yellow form from the strawberry guava. So this was the beginning 
And after uh, we start this cooperation, uh, Dr. Pedrosa was my advisor in my undergrads, my master, and also in my PhD. Uh, he starts a new cooperation with the University of Florida to survey the potential enemies of Brazilian pepper tree uh, or arueira, like we say here in Brazil. Uh, this project starts in 94 and uh, we just released the first insect in 2018. So more than 25 years of project looking for potential enemies and uh, specific enemies. Uh, the project starts with Dr. Fred Bennett and Dr. Dale Habeck. And after the project starts in Curitiba, we have other American researchers involved in this project. So Dr. James Kuda and Bill Overholt in, in the late 90s. Uh, also Rodrigo Diaz and Veronica Manrique. They were PhD students from Bill Overholt in Fort Pierce, in the, the quarantine from Fort Pierce and they cooperate with us also. Now, uh, Dr. Rodrigo is a professor in Louisiana State University. And during this period, uh, uh, from 94, 2002, we have also a cooperation from Dr. Julio Medal. Julio Medal was very important in this project because he was the researcher that visited us and uh, came to the field looking for the natural enemies in the beginning. And he did 65 trips during this period, not just for BP project, but also for Tropical Soda Apple that I will show in a few slides ahead. Julio was very, very important to the success of this project. Here we have a picture from with me in Switzerland and here a picture from Julio with Dr. Kuda. And uh, Kuda was invited many times, like Kuda was also to uh, make some talks and some classes to Brazilian students in the forest course uh, in Blumenau. So in 98, I applied for a position in the University of Blumenau and I was finalizing my PhD and uh, I moved to Blumenau and the Brazilian pepper tree moved together with me. It was uh, uh, my advisor gently uh, released the project to me and we start a new phase in the Brazilian pepper tree uh, in Blumenau. So here are some pictures from the city of Blumenau in South Santa Catarina state is a German city with a huge in German influence and also uh, Italian influences possible to see in the pictures and is very known in all Brazil because we have the biggest uh, Oktoberfest outside Germany. So people like beer here, as you can see here, uh, Blumenau is, is a place uh, for Germans in Brazil. So this is some pictures from the university where I located and here uh, our facilities, the lab uh, that we uh, coordinate for all these projects. We have uh, cooperation not only with North America, but also with Sierra Rule and also with Hodge University, uh, Ian, uh, that talked a little bit earlier, is one of our cooperators. So uh, in 2000, uh, USDA uh, was a new cooperator in this project with Greg Wheeler. Uh, and more recently, uh, Dr. Kerry Mantier from the quarantine in Fort Pierce also is a new cooperator in the, in the project. So after the arriving of Greg Wheeler, we expand the, the areas of insects collection until, until uh, the years 2000, we are collecting or serving the natural enemies just in South Brazil and border with Argentina and Paraguay. And with uh, the USDA arriving, we expand this area to all Brazil. So we, we selected and collected more than 100 insects associated with Brazilian pepper tree, but we uh, selected just four insects. So it's possible to see in this map uh, all the areas uh, 
surveyed in the coast and interior of South Brazil and the coast of uh, Southeast and Northeast Brazil. One of the insects selected was the sofly, Heteropeheia ubriqui. As we can see here is a wasp. Uh, the wasp lay uh, the eggs on the stems, is a uh, uh, insect from the Perdi family. And the larvae are the foliators. They, they have this uh, gregarious uh, behavior in the beginning, but in the last instance, they move uh, alone and pupate in the soil. The insect has a, a good potential. We develop a mass hearing. And we did many, many host uh, testing with this insect. And uh, the insect was uh, approved uh, in 97 or 96. And after a set of tests is about toxicity because the insect has a, a toxin. The larvae has a toxin that could be a problem for cattle or birds. And the insect was rejected even uh, being uh, specific. So uh, with the expanding of the area, we found uh, a trips, a pseudophil trips zucchini uh, in the coast of uh, Northeast Brazil and also in the interior of Minas Gerais. This is the insect, you can see the, the, the adults black and the, the nymphs in, in yellow orange. And this insect was approved for release in uh, 2018. So you can see here uh, the, the celebration that had in Adams Ranch in, in Fort Pierce to release this insect. And also you can see the uh, damage that the insect, the larves, uh, the nymphs and, and the adult cause sucking the young tissue and drying all these parts. So this uh, was the first insect released after almost 25 years of service. Uh, other insects selected and already approved for release are the Calophaya species. We have two Calophaya species, even we have more but I brought just two species to show you, Calophaya terebentifoli and Calophaya latiforceps. So it's an insect that produces a gall on the leaves. It's a, a pit gall. The gall is open, but the nymphs uh, live inside. And you can see it's a psyllid, so the adult is, is here. This is the Calophaya terementifoli, is a, a common um, um, insect in South Brazil. And this is Calophaya latiforceps, is a common insect in uh, Northeast Brazil. Uh, the damage is the same, they produce goals very similar, but there are uh, uh, morphological differences, of course, and you can see that the nymphs are, are without a, a, a line like the Calophaya. Terebentifolia has these two black lines and the Calophaya large force doesn't have. Another picture showing uh, the goals and the tiny adults uh, on the leaf. So we conduce many field uh, host range tests. Uh, other speakers uh, in the first part of this uh, meeting told about the importance of host range in open field host range in the native area from the insects. So we conduced many, many uh, tests here with all these insects to prove that they are specific. And another project we participate not directly or not in all projects because this project was uh, a project conducted by our colleagues in Argentina. But in the end of project, we also did some surveys in Brazil looking for natural enemies. So Gratiana Boliviana with the yellow star was the insect approved to release in Florida and by the Argentinian colleagues, Fuede. And we found another Gratiana in Brazil in, in the mountains in South, in the cold areas. And really was talking about these conditions in the previous talk. And, and we, we were looking uh, 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 for an insect adapted in the cold areas. We found Gratiana Graminia and was a surprise for us 
that this species was not specific. So it's the same genus, but was uh, polyphagous, uh, feeding most solanaceous plants. Uh, other insects here, like Metriona and Antonomus tenebrosus, also was studied. Antonomus has a, a potential with that, but Metriona is also polyphagous and was not approved. So I, this is the damage caused by Metriona, uh, Gratiana graminia. Uh, the damage is nice. And we conduce open field tests. And as I told, the insect was rejected. Here is the damage. Uh, really good, but unfortunately polyphagous insect. And here is the field release in Florida in May 2003, uh, when Gratiana boliviana were released. And here is Julio uh, with white t-shirt here, and here Daniel Gandolfo, Argentinian research, a very nice guy that unfortunately uh, passed away in 2006. But all the researchers involved in this project, mainly Greg Wheeler and Dean Williams, they did a very important tribute to, to Gandolfo, putting his name in the Pseudophilotrypis species, Pseudophilotrypis gandolfoi. It's a trips associated with Brazilian pepper tree in South Brazil, just in South Brazil. So part of our job during all these years was looking for the natural enemies, conduce uh, biological studies, and also uh, test the host range. And of course, looking for the export permits for those insects selected. So Brazil has really told previously with the Nagoya protocol, uh, things is a little bit more complicated, but Brazil is, uh, it's possible to get the permits, all, all the processes online today, but we have to submit all the papers and all information to three different agencies. So it's, it's, it's a long way to get a permit, at least four to six months, but instead of everything right and everything uh, done, uh, the permit is, is released, is approved, and we can uh, export uh, the insects. So what's the new perspective? So uh, we are very excited to perhaps in, in next year or after this pandemic ends to start new two projects with North America. One is with Myconia calvensis or Velvet Tree. We already uh, worked with this plant in the past and uh, this is one of the insects selected, Alorhogas is a Bacconi, the wasp that uh, attacks the fruit. And the other possibility is uh, princess flower. We never worked with this plant before, but it's a very common plant here in South Brazil, Tibuquino urbiliana. So this is the perspectives for the close future. Why I told in the beginning that uh, uh, was important fostering international cooperation, not just for my career or for my students, but also include Brazil as a, a country that will practice biological control of weeds in the future. Because we are now discussing the national strategy for invasive exotic species. So since 2018, discussing and preparing all the rules, all the protocols to have strategy to control and to prevent invasive exotic species in Brazil. So we have six components in this strategy and the, in white we have the components regarding er eradication, control and mitigation of impact. So we include in these components the possibility for a biological control of it. So we are right now discussing the protocols and uh, how to change our rules uh, because Brazil did biological control in agriculture for many years. We have many examples of success in agriculture, but we don't have with invasive species. And all our legislation is looking just for the agriculture. So we are now discussing this also to include the ecosystem in this legislation. So I would like to invite all of you to the next international symposium on biological control of weeds will be in Argentina in 2023. 
it was postponed by the pandemic, but we hope that we can keep these dates. And if you decide to participate in this symposium, please visit South Brazil before or after the symposium. It's a nice place to visit. We have beautiful lands, we have beautiful beaches, excellent barbecue and good craft beers also. So uh, it will be a pleasure to me to help anyone or everybody with information uh, to visit us. Here is my contacts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcelo. That was great. Our next presentation is a joint presentation by Rose de Klerk Float with the Invasive Plant Biological Control, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada out of Lethbridge, Alberta, and also Mark Schwartzlander with the Department of Entomology, Plant Pathology, and Nematology at the University of Idaho. So I will turn it over to Rose now. So I'm giving a joint talk with Mark. So I'm going to be giving the like the front end of uh, this talk with some background and a, a bit on what the Canadian side has been doing, our lab has been doing to help Mark in pulling together a petition for the first time to be submitted to the U.S. You know, after 32 years of waiting, because there's a lot of new information that's been gathered on both sides of the border to help support approval for release of this agent that I'll be talking about. Okay, so uh, house tongue is a cross-border problem. It's a weed, a problem weed of West Western North American rangelands that was brought over from Europe probably in the 1900s, coinciding with uh, farm settlement in Western North America. The problems with house tongue is that it displays forages that are used by cattle and it's toxic to both cattle and horses. And it's barb not, not, not shown here um, that stick to cattle, create marketing issues at auction. So uh, in response to this cross-border issue, a cross-border solution was to form a Canadian USA consortium to fund the overseas search and testing of our control agents by CABI in this case. So it began in Canada, but the U.S. joined in 1994. And on the first on the list of candidate agents to be enlisted and studied was the root weevil Mogolonis crucifer. The project testing began by CABI in 1989, and it was petitioned for release by Canada in 1993, with a supplement petition produced and submitted on the Canadian side again in 1996, but it was reviewed by TAG in the U.S. and the Review Committee on the Canadian side. It was given approval and released in Canada in 1997, but release was not approved on the American side. So after waiting nine years for an agent on the Canadian side, demand was great and releases began immediately. Early releases in uh, British Columbia, where house tongue was a real problem, were immediately successful. The insect established everywhere and was showing impact within two years. Noticeable at the individual plant level as shown here, but it also extended to the population level as shown here. Uh, we were astounded by how quickly it was working and how well. So what was happening at this time was that the insect was building <laughs> in high numbers on all this houndstone and was beginning to move. Many of these releases were on the U.S.-Canadian border and that caused a cross-border dilemma. So the U.S. had a number of listed threatened and endangered Boraginaceae species. This is the family the houndstone belongs to. And some of the genera were addressed in some cross-border collaborative work that Mark and I did after we had released in Canada. We did some testing. And I'm not going to get into that. Mark can cover it. But Hikelia venusa, the last plant on this list, is a endangered species in north central Washington, so close to the Canadian US border and, and thus of concern. So we did see an opportunity for further collaborative work. And because we had the agent in high numbers at our sites where we were uh, looking at its establishment and impact. But it happened uh, that a lot of these sites had the native uh, borages genera involved that we could be monitoring at the same time, which we did. 
And here we have Hansen Sinoglossum efficient. It's consistently attacked, usually at high percentages or levels, but every once in a while we'd find some attack on these non-targets like Lithospermum ruderale, this perennial borage species. Low levels always and sporadically as well. Lapula squarosa is a little annual and in this case there was no attack but sometimes it did occur as well. Now Jennifer Andres, uh, she did her uh, master's with Mark out of the University of Idaho and uh, when she started her master's she wanted some sites of course, uh, she couldn't use Mogolonese crucifer in the States and it hadn't uh, crossed the border yet. So she came up to Canada and used some of our older established sites. She supplemented the uh, releases that had been made by us of Mogolonese crucifer. And then she did like paired sampling of both Houndstone, shown with the, uh, the open bars, compared to non targets that were occurring at these sites. She had four sites in southern Alberta and two in BC. What she found was that the non-target species were attacked to a lesser degree than the hound's tongue in all cases, but the non-target use was inconsistent among species sites and years. Jen, I hope I'm representing your data correctly, but this was really important and she suspected that there might be some spillover occurring, you know, from the hound's tongue that was heavily attacked where the insect numbers were high onto the non-targets. And uh, usually spillover occurs when the target is getting under control by these high numbers of biocontrol agents. And uh, they tend to then spill over just temporarily, that's the operative word, to less preferred non-targets that happen to be growing in the vicinity of hound's tongue. Now, I had the, the chance to go back to these sites in 2011. So we revisited them and we just wanted to see what was going on. So the, the tan bars represents the number of juvenile Mogolonese crucifer per plant. Some similar data or that to, what, uh, to what Jennifer collected at her sites. And uh, the red bars represents any non-target attack or the numbers of non-targets. Overall, we found no attack on the non-targets, but, but there was attack on the few hound's tongue that we found. At sites. This is a peculiar situation and I'm not going to get into it other that the attack was found or the, the larvae and the eggs, mostly eggs actually, were found on Achillea floribunda which is a short-lived perennial and Achillea micrantha which is a long-lived perennial. But only two plants out of 17 here and one plant of three here. None of the larvae we found except for one I think were in the root proper in these cases. And then in BC, we had a chance to go to one of our two sites in both in 2011 and 2019. And in both cases, we found no attack on the non-targets. And in this case, BC2, we found no attack on the few houndstongue we found or the non-target of the Spermum ruderale. Another part of this story is that I had a PhD student, Haley Catton. She was concerned about this Hachilia situation, especially in relation to Hachilia venusa on the U.S. side. So she tailored a study to look at the population effects of non-target use using a surrogate, uh, Hachilia micrantha, which like venusa is a perennial and, and long-lived and has the same root morphology. And so these plants were growing neck and neck uh, in southwestern Alberta and she set up a three-year study to look at the population changes and also the behavior of the insects around its hosts and the non-target. So some of our key findings was that herbivory by the agent was restricted just to the year of release and when it did occur non-target feeding was rare and of low intensity. And then she also found that the agent did not sustain populations without hound's tongue. And uh, any feeding on the non-targets was restricted to temporary spillover occurrences. In terms of the populations, she found reductions in hound's tongue to below sustainable levels, but not of the non-target populations. Also, she went back to some of our older sites to check out what was going on with Hickelia micrantha in relation to Mogolonese crucifer, but she found no persistent establishment on this plant. 
Now, during the dissection, she uh, also couldn't help but notice the differences in the root morphology between hound's tongue and the non-target Hachilia micrantha. So here we have a, a hand cross-section uh, of hound's tongue. To show what it's like, it's a biannual, it has a top root that's fleshy, and it's much like a carrot root, um, but the whole thing is built for carbohydrate storage. The insects really capitalize on that, and these roots can get just full of larvae, and the larvae do tend to feed in the vascular, the center, the vascular cylinder, but they also feed on the cortex, and they can also feed on the surface, on, on the epidermis. So basically, they can feed on the whole root. But Hachilia uh, micrantha root, there's only some living tissue associated with the vascular traces, which are these little light areas, bundles in this cross section. The rest is all made up of dead tissues. And, you know, where she found the feeding, like this is a hound's tongue root that's been pretty well demolished by a whole number of Mogolomy crucifer larvae. The third instars really do a lot of damage. But a cross section of the Achillea micrantha root that shows some feeding. Uh, these are feeding tunnels by Mogolomy crucifer larvae. They seem to be restricted to the, those bundles, those vascular traces, where they feed mostly the, to the outer part of these bundles, not where this light-colored area is. With further sectioning, we found out that it's just full of dead xylem cells. So even there, they are restricted within the bundles to just feeding on the outer edges. I've got to basically change that 65% to a lower level because they don't have much to feed on in the roots. And the summer I ran around looking at these other non-targets that Jennifer uh, studied at her, at her sites in the foothills of southern Alberta. And I got asking the same question, you know, is there enough material to sustain populations of uh, Mogolonis crucifer on these different non-targets? I would say for sure not on Lithosperma ruderale that even has more rot and less tissue to feed on than Hachilia micrantha is shown here in cross-section. And uh, Cryptantha spiculifera, beautiful little perennial. There seems to be some cortex to feed on in the root. Our vascular cylinders mostly made up of dead xylem cells, so not there. But these roots are so tiny, I don't think it can support a big population. And finally, Hachilia floribunda, which is a short-lived perennial. It has much of the same features where there's probably a lot of xylem and dead tissue on, in the inside of these vascular traces. So they would be restricted to the outside. And when we were cutting through these roots, we found out that they were very lignified, very tough. So I somehow doubt that those roots would be very edible as well if we built uh, populations. So now I'm passing it on to Mark. I just wanted to add one slide about the history of it all. The original work was done by Kevy, of course, between 1988 and 1996. And the petition was submitted. One of the reasons or concerns by tech reviewers and the Fish and Wildlife Service was that not sufficient numbers of native North American plant species in the family were tested and none of the TNE species were tested. Mind you, this is all pre-internet time era, so it, it, it was much more complicated to, to get those plant species or even know about them in the first place. And then the first international project, and Rose talked about that was really when, when she had permission to release the insect in Canada, um, the Wyoming Weed and Pest Districts really provided plant rootstocks and seeds for a number of North American plant species that she then could test in Canada and that can be tested in Switzerland. And the result of that emphasis on North American plant species was still the same. There was development across genera, North American or European. Mostly attack was much less than it was on hound's tongue. But there was also some development on two TNE species and a partial development on the third TNE species that was the other part of Jen Andre's master's thesis. And with that, really, in 2004, there was really no further work planned for the United States, and we were under the assumption this insect will not get released ever in the United States. What changed then, of course, is the uh, fact that the Weaver made it uh, inadvertently into the U.S. in 2007 in Washington, 
in Montana in 2008 and in Idaho in 2009. And that triggered an on-target monitoring study that we did between 2010 and 11. But the motivation was really to assess the potential risk this could have for North American borreganaceae. And I will talk about that in one second. But then uh, 2013, so that's a decade after we thought we would not do anything with that insect anymore, we began to meddle in the chemical ecology and physiology of the insect and host recognition behavior specifically. And I wanted to acknowledge like Rose ha did for Haley and um, these young researchers down at the bottom of the slide who, if we should be allowed to permit to release the insect, have uh, really a very important role to play in there because they work their hearts out on this project. So first, this is Rachel Winston, Tessa Scott, and Dr. Aaron Weed did work in 2010, 2011. We really took an area-wide approach and looked at the uh, Washington-Canada border and the Idaho-Canada border at a total of three watersheds. And the idea was really to capture everything that was going on, all houndstime populations, all weaver populations, and all non-target populations, and see what kind of attack we would find. And what we found was very, very little whatsoever. So if you look, I hope you can see that on these four graphs to the right, there are a few, a total of six populations that have red circles. And those are the only populations, non-target plant populations, where we found weevils sitting on the plants. When it came to dissecting plants for larval attack, there was uh, really nothing to report. So the downside of this study was that it, it takes really a lot of time, a lot of manpower, and you will not capture all plant species that exist in that area just because you're limited by what you can find and what your expertise is. So then we started to do chemical ecology, making use of the fact that you know, specialist herbivores have to find their host plants. They typically examine them and then they accept them and uh, do feed and lay eggs. And in the first stage, the finding stage or the pre-alightment host selection phase, insects require use typically olfactory and visual plant cues to decide whether a plant is worth the effort. So we, we used one of these four-arm olfactimeters that was developed in the Netherlands in the 1990s. And we measured via video the initial choice that an insect would make uh, if it is released in the center of this arena here, the final choice and the proportion it would spend in each of these four quadrants. And you, then you can measure the attraction, whether the insect is attracted to a visual cue or a chemical cue of one plant species over another, you can measure indifference, whether it does not distinguish between a plant species and purified air or an empty branch for visual cues, or repellents, uh, whether it is actually preferring an empty quadrant or purified air over the scent of a plant. And you see in this olfactometer on the lower right that we now use visual cues to for Mogulonus crucifer, not only foliar cues, leaves, but also flower cues, and we have really exciting data on that, but that will not make it in the petition, I think. So then you get data like this, and what you what's interesting here, obviously yellow um, fields, where you have a lot of North American plant species, including all five TME species, where the weevil reacted to repellents, in, at least in the proportion of time spent in a quadrant or in indifference. So it does not distinguish these plants from purified air. And on the right-hand side, this is choice test with the plant species and houndstung, and the weevils are almost always attracted to houndstung. And that is great data. That was really unexpected and a game changer, as we thought. You can do other things with the video data that you record. You can look whether these insects get arrested. An insect, an herbivore insect gets arrested if it really likes where it has landed or sits, and it will then start to feed, commence feeding, or even lay eggs. If you do not have any arrestment, um, the weevil continues to walk, and it means that it doesn't find the plant as a suitable host. What is uh, important to note here is that the two purple arrows indicate uh, Plagibortus hirtus, one of the TNE species that is the least rejected by the weevil, and Hakeria venosa, and there's no um, arrestment observed there whatsoever. So then we also do what we call, you know, what I consider the gold standard of tests, which is really very 
elaborate, but it works great, where we have um, pure non-target plots, pure houndstongue plots, and mixed plots, and we release the insects right here in the center and observe the weevils for 10 days and see what they do, where they go, what they uh, attack, and whether there's the larval development. And all the plants that are shaded in purple, we have now completed, and the data looks quite good. And the ones that are not shaded in purple, I really would have loved to include, but we just didn't have the time this year, and we ran out of time. One more thing, you can use these volatiles that are bioactive, these are specific volatile organic compounds or probably used plant volatiles that insects react to and compose those into a repellent system if you want. Now we know for hound's tongue that one of these volatiles is uh, causing the attractants. We also know for a few plant species now that there are specific volatiles that cause repelling responses in the weevil. And you, know, you do a bunch of physiological studies to find that out. Those we uh, want to formulate into um, a repellent system because we think it's interesting and because the Fish and Wildlife Service has asked us to do so. One more thing, you see in pink here, the sentence that was in the Fish and Wildlife Service memorandum of 2000, where they said that they're really not happy with uh, re releasing the weevil in the United States, because we included in the petition for release in 1996, that in addition to hound's dung, there's mentioning of three plant species in Europe on which the weevil may or may not be found and which it may or may not use as host plant. And it always has kind of irked me because I, I really do not think that that's an accurate statement. So we did initial testing this year using the closest native relatives of hound's dung. And for that, I have to thank Massimo and the Kebby folks who really go out in Italy and Central Europe to find these plant species. And we can really narrow down what the weevil likes as far as congeners in Europe and what it does not like. So these are, again, these multiple choice tests based on visual floral plant cues, basically flowers. And there's only two, Sanoglossum montanum and Sanoglossum germanicum, which none of us can morphologically with a pure eye distinguish from hound's tongue that the weevil may utilize based on our data now. So with that, um, you know, it's kind of weird that, that the whole morning we got to see these beautiful presentations of many weeds and many insects from across the world. And here Rose and I talk about one insect for one weed that we studied for 32 years, but um, it is what it is. So it's a unique situation. If the weaver would not be present in the United States, I think it would be hard to ask to release it officially. The petition that we, that we write obviously relies heavily on chemical ecological data and on the non-target monitoring data that Rose collected and that we collected. There will be really species-specific non-target monitoring protocols for a number of species that uh, we will discuss in a petition that we believe um, deserve greater attention. And I also want to point out that without the Fish and Wildlife Service, who opposed, of course, the release, but also helped us really access field sites, provided us with T and E species. And recently, we have a lot of discussions with that are super constructive. The, the repetitioning would not be possible. Also, there's a worldwide taxonomic work group for Borgenaceae that have done incredible work during the last five to seven years relining the taxa within the family. And that makes much more sense with what we see in the weevil. So we are cautiously optimistic about the prospects. We will see, and the petition will be submitted before the end of this year. And that's all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mark and Rose. Our next presenter is Darcy Oishi with Hawaii Department of Agriculture. And I will turn it over to you, Darcy. Thank you all for inviting me. I'm with the Hawaii Department of Agriculture and my silent co-presenter at uh, the uh, U.S. Forest Service Institute of Pacific Island Forestry. So together, we're the two lead programs that conduct the bulk of biological control work in Hawaii. Our focus is primarily classical biocontrol. Hawaii Department of Agriculture does classical biocontrol of weeds and insects. And Forest Service focuses on classical biocontrol of forest weeds. There are other smaller programs in Hawaii, the University of Hawaii and USDA Agriculture Research Service also do biological control work here in Hawaii. 
how we operate is we're a close partnership. So talking about collaboration, our collaboration starts just between our two agencies. So the Hawaii Department of Agriculture has broad statutory authority in the state for biological control. So we don't have to obtain permission from the state of Hawaii in order to import biological control agents or their targets into our facilities. And this courtesy is extended to the U.S. Forest Service. We also are backup facilities for each other, which is good because last time I checked, the closest backup facility for either of us is 4,500 miles. And it's always fun when there's a hurricane coming and I get a lot of questions, even though for the same distance, nobody calls any of the other labs over in Florida, even though they get a lot more hurricanes than we do. We also share resources for foreign exploration. So if we're going someplace, our permits are shared together and we collaborate basically on all projects. HCOA handles the first releases of the projects and we handle a lot of the politicking. And Tracy has a facility over in Volcano. We also have a functional pathology facility, uh, level three, uh, it no longer can meet standards. So um, I may start a GoFundMe so we can uh, get new facilities because um, I've been working 10 years for new facilities here in Hawaii. We have one exploratory entomologist and one insectary entomologist here and a technician down 15 and it's down 75 percent from when I started in 2008 and Tracy has a lead scientist a permanent tech a soft money tech and a postdoc and an intern so um, our international collaborations really are really centered around spam movies. Uh, this is how, what I do to make people collaborate with us. I've got Richard Hill here and from Landcare and Joel Price. We were doing gorse work and I of course made them eat spam musubi. So if you're an international partner, you will have to try and eat some spam with us. This is how we seal the deal or how I seal the deal here in Hawaii. The first project I wanted to talk about is chromolina odorata, devil weed, and this has already been mentioned. So this is a group project with Forest Service as the lead and HDOA is assisting with the logistics. The Hawaii Department of Natural Resources, the Army, the University of Guam, Joint Base Marianas and Biosecurity Queensland are all helping out on this project for us here in Hawaii. And we're trying to bring in the golf fly well, actually, we just got the golf fly in last week into the volcano facility. So how we're working this project is Forest Service is handling the rearing and conducting the tests. Queensland Biosecurity and Guam are actually supplying our flies. Army Natural Resources is supplying the, the plants for chromolina and the funding. And DLNR is working on compliance docs for our eventual hopeful release for this project. And HDOA is actually moving the plants around and providing technical support. And this project was started entirely during the pandemic and we were in a holding pattern for nine months because we couldn't get insects shipped, not just because of the pandemic, but because of something called an international special commodity contract. If you all ship with a brown uniform, the brown boxed company, with uh, yellow wording in their name and are having trouble, please feel free to contact me and I can help you get past the international special commodity contracts. The next project is Shyness. And this is actually my ideal project type in terms of international or in this case, national collaboration. Although as you've seen from Marcelo, there is also an international component. This is a Shyness infestation here on the Hawaii Island. I like to say this is my preferred project type primarily because ARS did all of our host testing for us off island and all we did was provide plants and the shipping and occasional technical advice and it has been one of the cheapest projects for the department and, and the Forest Service and while this agent of thrips has been released over in Florida and actually we removed ourselves from the U.S. petition. We did not want to hold up the technical advisory committee group. 
and its review and concerns over some artifacts that were seen in the initial testing. And we do expect opposition from beekeepers. And right now we're beginning the, the work of generating compliance documents for the state process for release here in Hawaii. GORSE is another one of our long-standing research projects. I picked this photo because it does not look like Hawaii. This was up on the slopes of Haleakala on Maui. And this is a unique project because uh, we've actually engaged the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. Hawaiian Homelands has long been a partner working on GORSE for us here in Hawaii. Land and Natural Resources really kicked in on this project and our long-term partner has always been Land Care Research over in New Zealand. And a recent part we've added is Oregon Department of Agriculture. And this project is a little unique in another way as the primary shareholder is Haleakala Ranch, who is arguably the leader here in Hawaii in, in identifying effective ways of managing gorse. So despite past releases, gorse is inadequately controlled here in Hawaii and continental U.S. is seeing wider uh, spread and impacts, especially in Oregon and California. Uh, so here in Hawaii, we're focusing on the gourd seed pod moth, but we're also open to uh, revisiting past releases to see if larger scale releases and changes in where released and how we release based upon information we're getting out of New Zealand might be effective at getting these agents established and having impacts. And hopefully uh, no one starts a controlled burn after we've conducted a release in the future. HDOA has also supplied uh, some thrips over for Oregon to, for release. And we're also open to new exploration for course file control. And this is actually what we want to see with course. Uh, this was actually done through mechanical means by Hawaiian homelands on a large infestation over in Gorse on Hawaii Island. One of the Forest Service's lead projects is Albizia Fakutori Molokana. We've got a large range of partners here and in international partners. This one is unique because the project is funded by Hawaii Department of Transportation, who's had a lot of impact with limbs falling on state highways and doing damage here in Hawaii during high wind events. So foreign exploration has been done on this and some work is already happening. We're focusing at this point on a stem boring weevil, a leaf galling mite, and a galling rust fungus. This project was impacted by COVID a little bit, we had to cancel some of our joint foreign exploration trips that we were planning for this target. So uh, most of this work is happening offshore at this point. Fireweed is another project. I did not list all of our South African partners that I wanna thank for assistance with us in the field and helping with the logistics on getting fireweed agents out of country and into our hands here in Hawaii. University of Hawaii has also been a partner primarily on post-release studies and CSIR role over in Australia has been a great partner working on this. Our agent that we had released is Secuzio Extensa. This was released in 2013. We'll be seeking funding for an assessment of the impacts of the release although it seems to uh, be favorable at this point in time. The photo in your upper left-hand corner is actually of Galeria odorata, which was mentioned earlier this morning, Cape Ivy, this pest over in California. In our non-target studies, Galeria was being attacked by Sicuzio. And what we found in our initial releases is Secuzio seemed to really like Delaria and it defoliated vast tracts of Delaria on Maui and Hawaii Island during our releases. So this is actually impacts on Cape Ivy and we had proceeded despite the non-target effects because none of the non-targets that were hit were of native 
importance. They were all introduced species that were of weedy in nature here in Hawaii. Sukuzu is still an active project. These are some of the agents that we've looked at. At the top, we've got the Sucuzio defoliator. Next, with the extrude, is the Physetoides flowerhead feeder. We've got the Gastroclesis stem galler, Sphenella flowerhead feeder, the Argentine Aginiosa leaf feeder, Chukunea head flowerhead feeder, Obesia root feeder, Melagorat Misa stem borer, Nyctomera defoliator, and uh, Puccinia rust. Uh, We've been in communication with CSIRO about gastroclesis. Gastroclesis is a nice agent that we've had difficulty working with. It is very impactful, but it is extremely long lived and testing has been problematic because of its long life cycle. We have a difficulty keeping some of our target, our non-targets alive in containment uh, and sometimes even fireweed in containment for the, these long periods of time for the gastroclesis life cycle. Himalayan raspberry is another one of our targets. This is actually led by Forest Service. Cabby has been working on this for us and we're in partnership with Landcare. Funding has been uh, obtained from the Nature Conservancy and Hawaii Invasive Species Council has also been funding work on rubus for us. It, it's been problematic because the rubus here in Hawaii is a hybrid, so we have some non-target effects, likely. So we've been having searches in India and China for host specific enemies that will not attack our local Hawaiian endemic rubus, and these include a leaf beetle and a fungus. And we've got the fly also. African tulip is the last species I wanted to talk about. This is we haven't yet settled on a lead yet on whether this will be Forest Service or HDOA leading this project. This is something that is targeted by SPC, Land Care, and Biosecurity Queensland. Right now, our limitation is this, this, is, this project is not live and cooking yet. We're still in the process of identifying funding for the project and we've been unsuccessful and honestly, we're also short of staff. So in this picture, which is from Hana, from a drone on Maui, the African tulip are all the nice, pretty little red flowers in your screen. And what it's doing is it's pushing out our pandanus and other natives within the Hana region. It's also used fairly widely as an ornamental. So there would be, there would be a certain level of fun with this project. That's all I have on the docket. So I think I've got a few more minutes, so uh, I'm available for questions. Great, we do have, thank you so much for that great update on uh, biocontrol projects in Hawaii. Thank you. This is Jen Andres. Darcy, do you have the Xapion beetle for gorse in Hawaii? Xapion. Xapion. Um, oh yeah, uh, yes, yes we do. Okay. Is it doing anything over there? Not enough. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, really, what we're hoping is Cydia will be the Gorsi pod moth. We're anticipating it'll likely be the most effective agent for our situation. I'm not sure what will likely be best for the continent. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Darcy. I really enjoyed all your photos as well. Um, so our next and last presentation is from Matt Purcell who is with USDA ARS Australian Biological Control Laboratory. And I believe it is like 6.30 in the morning there. So thank you so much for getting up early to join us today, Matt. No problem at all. Good afternoon to you all and good morning from Australia. I'm Matt Purcell. I'm the director of the USDA ARS Australian Biocontrol Laboratory or ABCL, uh, which is based in Brisbane, Australia. ABCL is one of four USDA IRS overseas biocontrol laboratories and our mission in Australia is to conduct research projects to find, identify and evaluate and prioritise potential biocontrol agents for use against the US invasive species uh, that are native to Australia and to Asia. Our lab has its origins in the mid 80s when it was established mainly to look for aquatic weed biocontrol agents in Australia at that time. Our lab is jointly operated by ARS and the Australian Federal Government Science Agency, CSIRO, 
who also has a large biocontrol research group presently and historically, and we've always worked very closely together. And this facility has very experienced staff, many employed for more than 20 years here at ABCL. We also have excellent glasshouses and insectary facilities, and uh, more importantly, a state-of-the-art quarantine facility into which we can import and test insect biocontrol agents that we've discovered in Asia and for potential release into the US. Originally, all of our exploration was conducted in Australia, but ABCL has developed a network of collaborators in the Asia Pacific region. Currently, collaborators include the USDARS Sino American Biocontrol Laboratory in Beijing, which is administered by the Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences, uh, Hankyong University in South Korea, uh, the Indian Statistical Institute, and uh, also NBCRC in Bangkok, Thailand. I should mention that many of the updates I'm presenting today are on behalf of our excellent regional collaborators, so I just want to acknowledge them up front. In my presentation today, I'll give an overview of our exploratory research on eight US invasive weeds, with an emphasis on those species uh, to which we currently devote most of our resources. Now, these species are the terrestrial plants, old world climbing fern, ear leaf acacia, Australian pine, and the aquatic plants, hydrilla, yellow floating heart, and uh, retazola. I'll also provide a quick update on our biocontrol efforts ongoing to control melaleuca and also another smaller project, uh, Danny Rose Myrtle. Many Australian and Asian native plants have become invasive in Florida, so we've formed a very close relationship with the scientists at the USDARS Invasive Plant Research Laboratory, IPRL, in Fort Lauderdale, and particularly with Greg Wheeler, Melissa Smith, and Ellen Lake, who I believe has just left that location uh, and has moved on to bigger and better things. Uh, great funding support has always been given for a long time by the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and also the South Florida Water Management District. So I'd like to acknowledge them up front today as well. For aquatic weeds such as hydrilla and floating hearts, we've received wonderful support from the US Army Corps of Engineers, the RDC, over the many years, and we currently work very closely with Nathan Harms. One of our major long-term targets has been the climbing fern, Ligodium microfilum. Now, this fern is native to most of the old world, but the introduction into Florida was thought to have been from Cape York in Queensland, Australia. In the native range, it's rarely problematic and grows as a delicate fern in the understory. However, in Florida, it forms massive curtains um, around native tree vegetation, even growing to the top of the canopy where it then smothers all of native vegetation beneath. It also acts as a conduit for spreading fires into the tree canopy. Three agents have been released against Ligodium in Florida, but only two have really established. The defoliating moth, Neomesotema conspercatalis, is native to Asia and Australia, and specimens for the Northern Territory in Australia were tested and sub subsequently released in Florida in 2008, after which they readily established. Um, the area fired gall forming mite, Floracaris peripi, is highly specific, and after establishment, its numbers have been slightly increasing across Florida. A second defoliating moth, Ostromesotema camptozinali, uh, was collected along Australia's east coast and was released in Florida, but unfortunately never established. And the reasons for this are still pretty unclear. But we're working on strategies for possible reintroduction into Florida, including looking at moth populations from Cape York, where Ligodium is a genetic match for the Florida introduction. After its approval for release in Florida, 2.9 million Ostromesotema moths have been released at multiple sites across southern Florida. The ARS lab in Fort Lauderdale has an excellent production line for producing these insects for release, and it's funded significantly through the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan, or SERP. As you can see in the slide, the impacts have been significant, particularly on the tree islands of Florida. The larva skeletonized the pinnae of leaves, and following defoliation, the plants are much less tolerant to cold frost. Unfortunately, significant parasitism has occurred, and the outbreaks such as these are quite sporadic, or can be sporadic. Also released in 2008 was a gall forming mite, which was studied at ABCL in Brisbane. Uh, this mite is highly specific, but they have to be matched to their fern host genotype. A lot of molecular work was performed by John Goolsby from ARS when he was based in Australia to determine host associations so that the correct and most impactful mite was released in Florida, which was actually collected from the Iron Range on Cape York of Queensland and the likely source of the US climbing fern introduction. Once again, millions of these mites have been released but their impact has not been as immediate as the defoliating moth. But they're slowly ramping up, um, seem to be ramping up through time, which is promising. It's possible that the greatest impacts for this mite are yet to come. And then it's also possible that they're having a great impact on fern reestablishment. The two agents thus far have had significant impact, uh, particularly the moth, but these impacts have been seasonal and been slow to ramp up, as I mentioned previously. 
Three other agents discovered by ABCL are currently undergoing final testing in US quarantine and pending release. There's a defoliating moth we discovered in Singapore and in Thailand, Ligomesotema australia, a leaf-eating moth from Hong Kong, Calipistria exotica, and a defoliating sawfly from Thailand, Neostrombocerus albicomus. If some or all of these agents are released and established, there is excellent potential for further control of oligodium in Florida. We also discovered a complex of four stem boring ligodium moth uh, species in Australia and in Asia, which are shown on the left of the slide here. The Thai species is a uh, spectacular spider mimic. You can see that on the bottom left of the slide. All of these borers have been extremely difficult to rear and as yet they've been impossible to colonize. We're persisting with their evaluation because they're so well adapted to ligodium. And you can see that in the pictures, how long and slender they are, the larva are and adapted to the stems. They're also likely to be highly specific. Recent efforts have been directed to the Saigamizatima bamigabora, which is only found in the small region on the tip of Cape York. You can see that on the inset map on the slide. This is a very remote and vulnerable Aboriginal community, and we haven't had access since the start of the COVID pandemic. Limited numbers of the moth are usually available for testing due to this restricted range, and also the logistical challenges in getting to Cape York itself, which is close to 2,000 kilometres north of our lab. A new rearing techniques uh, are being trialled at our lab, including feeding larva with the removed internal protosteel of the stems uh, rather than using the whole plant. So that's quite labour intensive, but we're getting some partial success given that now we've had larva surviving longer than usual. And we've also observed pupation in some of those stems. So it's reasonably promising. We're also trialling the use of uh, small actively growing croziers and rhizomes to try and get these moths through. Moving to one of our Australian only plant targets, uh, ear leaf acacia or acacia auriculiformis. It's native to northern regions of Australia and problematic on the east coast of the US, particularly once again in Florida. A lot of our acacia field research has been conducted with indigenous ranges in northern Australia who have a vast knowledge of Australian flora and fauna. The first agent being considered is the leaf eating chrysomelid beetle um, we've collected in North Queensland and in the Northern Territory, and it causes uh, defoliation. And the populations from the Northern Territory and North Queensland are under evaluation at uh, the ARS lab in Fort Lauderdale with Melissa Smith and at the University of Florida at Fort Pierce with Terry Mintia. This insect looks highly host specific and it's uh, really damaging. We're also currently evaluating a Triclogaster wall wasp, which is found in North Queensland only, which is very damaging and highly specific. Uh, gall formation, which can be seen in the top right hand side of the slide, severely impacts the growth, uh, particularly that of seedlings and saplings. Related Triclogaster wasps have been used very effectively as biocontrol agents in South Africa against invasive acacia. Um, other leaf tying Macrobatha moths are also being colonised and tested here at ABCL. A new and more recent project is Australian pine or Casuarina species. We've had several attempts at initiating biocontrol programs for Australian pine over the many years, but we've been stifled by it being valued as an ornamental tree, particularly in Florida, and also as earmarked but never used as a windbreak in citrus orchards in Florida uh, to prevent the spread of citrus canker. Three species of Australian pine are highly invasive in the US, particularly Casuarina exocytifolia in Florida where it causes property damage uh, during hurricanes, given it has a shallow root system, which causes large trees to fall. More importantly, they also modify pristine natural areas and interfere with turtle and American crocodile nesting in the coastal and offshore island areas. Seed production in Florida is really prolific, as you can see in the bottom left of the slide. Significant funds have been allocated by the USDA Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service for biocontrol research. And we've already identified and tested some excellent ages to control these trees, and there's great potential for success. We have defoliating xylorichid moth, numerous seed feeding herbivores and gall formers, and a particular in of uh, interest is a gall forming wasp, Solidricodes. Uh, this gall wasp have been inflicting significant damage to Casuarina equicetifolia trees in Guam, and they have great potential given the demonstrated field damage that we've seen on that site and it's also likely to be very host specific. Our current aquatic plant targets include the submerged aquatic weed hydrilla, that's a long-term project, and yellow floating heart. Hydrilla has been in the US since the 1950s and it's continually expanded its range. Monoecious and dioecious forms of hydrilla exist after three separate introductions into the US. These plants are difficult and expensive to manage, forming dense infestations that crowd or shade out native plant species 
They also reduce water flows and air exchange, increase sedimentation, block waterways and restrict our recreation. Hydrilla has become resistant also to many of the treatment herbicides, which is a worry. Biocontrol is seen as a necessary part of an integrated management plan for these aquatic plants. Four insect agents were released for biocontrol of hydrilla in the 70s and 80s, but only two leaf mining flies established and only partial control was achieved, particularly in the southern United States. My new agents are definitely needed, particularly for monoecious hydrilla uh, in the cooler regions in the US where the leaf mining flies uh, that were released cannot overwinter. Um, yellow floating heart, I mean, Portis peltata is a relatively new target and as yet no biocontrol agents have been released, but foreign exploration uh, surveys have been started in Asia. Uh, they're of Eurasian origin and genetics will tell us what the likely origin of the introduction in the US was. Uh, looking at this map of the US, the shading in green is the current status of monoecious hydrilla in the US. It's become more of a concern in recent years, expanding into the colder regions, particularly in the northeastern US. Um, it has the potential to invade the Great Lakes, which of course would be an environmental disaster. Looking historically, initial surveys for biocontrol agents did not focus or even record which biotype the agents were collected from. Those imported, evaluated and released uh, appear to have been adapted to the dioecious hydrilla, that's a shaded orange area on the map in the more southern parts of the US. The biocontrol agents are required to specifically attack monoecious hydrilla in the cooler climates of the US. Also on the map, I've indicated the Connecticut River, uh, which is the site for a recent new introduction of hydrilla. That's the third known introduction of hydrilla into the US. Since 2014, with the Corps of Engineers, we've conducted extensive hydrilla surveys in China and South Korea, collecting both plant samples and recording insect herbivores. These plant samples were genetically characterized and we found site locations for hydrilla which matched the original US monoecious and dioecious introduction, known as clade B and shown as red circles for monoecious hydrilla and the blue circles for dioecious. Also, we've identified uh, sites that have the more recent Connecticut River introduction, and this is known as clade C and shown as the green triangles. Also on this map is indicated the latitude for the Connecticut River. Given the distribution of our sites, we now have a very good understanding of the hydrilla natural enemies, which should represent a good choice for cold adapted insects and possibly suited for overwintering in the northern US and matched to their hydrilla host. Also note that clade C, the Connecticut River biotype, is the most widespread of hydrilla groups in the native range. And given its distribution, we now know it has the potential to spread, uh, to spread well outside the Connecticut River in the US. Thus far, um, our intensive testing efforts have been restricted to leaf mining flies. Um, the phylogenetic tree on this slide shows the phylogeny of the leaf mining flies found on hydrilla in our China Korean surveys, as well as those on GenBank. At ABCL, we tested a Korean species that was only found on the US monoecious hydrilla genotype, which is shown in the green box, but it unfortunately fed on the American native Melodia canadensis and a Potomagetan species, and uh, it was therefore rejected. The Korean leaf mining fly damage is depicted in the picture in the top right of the slide, uh, which indicates why these flies are of interest because of the damage that they can cause. Since COVID, we've had to halt our Asian surveys to well, almost completely on hydrilla, and we've pivoted our research into Australia. Our previous surveys of hydrilla in Australia in the mid 80s focused almost exclusively on subtropical and tropical regions and not on herbivores and temperate regions indicated by the blue oval at the bottom of Australia. The diversity of the flies in Australia in the phylogeny is limited to our Brisbane hydrilla specimens only, which were collected in the 80s. We expect that given the unexplored geographic range of hydrilla in Australia, this fly phylogeny will probably expand significantly and probably determine other potential hydrilla biocontrol agents, particularly in the cooler temperate regions. Herbivore surveys are planned uh, next year and field sites uh, have been identified, which we've done over the last couple of years. The equivalent southern latitude of the Connecticut River is also indicated on the map for climatic purposes. This is a table of the herbivores from clade C hydrilla collected in Asia and it includes four leaf mining hydrilliophiles and other insect herbivores that could be potential biocontrol agents for the Connecticut River hydrilla. These insects will be evaluated when our international exploration uh, programs recommence post-COVID and we'll engage our collaborators in Korea and China to assist with these surveys uh, even if it means in our absence. Moving to floating hearts, uh, this map pinpoints our extensive foreign collections of Nymphoides peltata made in Korea and China. The greatest effort has been in South Korea uh, with extensive surveys conducted since 2018. 
But as can be seen from the map, we've collected across a broad geographic range. Collaborators in Korea from Hankyong University are very experienced, having been trained by us over several years, uh, while the USDA, IRS, China, American Lab is a recent engagement. I should also note that CABI is also conducting surveys for yellow floating heart in Europe. Thus, 18 insect and mite species have been collected on yellow floating heart. However, only the 12 species listed in black are likely to feed on live plant material, and only a few of these are likely to be host specific. Of most interest are the bagus weevils, which have been found commonly in northern China and less so in Korea. They're depicted in the top right hand uh, part of the slide. The adults are found on flowers, but the larvae destroy the developing seeds uh, within fruit below the water surface and uh, very exciting prospects for biocontrol. In South Korea, there is also a large leaf mining hydrilia fly. The adult larvae are pictured in the center right of the slide. The larvae tunnel the leaf lamina and appear to pupate in the leaf petiole, and the damage is quite significant again. Pictured in the bottom right is a septoria pathogen from Korea, similar if not the same as a pathogen recorded in Maine in the uh, invasive Eurasia range in 2019 by Nathan Harms. The pathogen was named Septoria Varsia in, in Maine. And importantly, it hasn't been recorded for many other plant species and could be highly host specific. And we're currently determining whether to pursue this pathogen as a classical biocontrol agent that could be possibly be tested outside the constraints of quarantine given its presence in the US. Beretta zola, or zola panata, is similar to Zavinia and is native uh, to Australia, Asia and Africa. It's also another aquatic weed target, which is becoming more problematic in Florida, particularly in the north of the state. The molecular diagnostics indicated that the closest match for the US introduction was actually Redozola from near Brisbane in Australia, where ABCL is located. So we're in a position to find agents regionally here. It's also advantageous that a close relative, uh, uh, Azola folliculoides, or sometimes called Azola ruber in Australia, it's also a native to both the US and Australia, which means we can validate host specificity of potential agents in the field, given their distributions are overlapping, as can be seen from the Australian maps. A lot of effort thus far has been on the weevil, Vagus clarenciensis. This insect is very damaging, it can completely clear infestations of the Zola panata at sites in Australia. Another related Vagus weevil has also been used as a biocontrol agent um, against the Zola folliculoides in South Africa and parts of Europe with spectacular results. However, unfortunately, the bagus collected from Azola panata in Australia have also been found on Azola folliculoides. The inset table in the top right of the slide shows the number of sites this bagus weevil has been collected and from each Azola species across Australia. The adjacent figure given the parentheses is a percentage of the total number of sites visited that this figure represents, which isn't all that different between Azola species. However, the number of weevils was much lower on um, Azola folliculoides with only five weevils per collection when compared to Azola panata, which had an average of 18 weevils per collection. Also of interest in the host range testing, weevils field collected from Azola palat from Lees Road and Mogul Road near Brisbane, much preferred to feed on Azola panata, given in the central bar graph on the slide. And most of these tests, the weevils failed to develop on Azola folliculoides, but the results were inconsistent. We had assumed that our insect cultures weren't pure and possibly contaminated by a cryptic weevil species, but thus far we haven't been able to identify any differences. In multi-generational studies, the weevils died out in the sixth generation on Azola folliculoides, but survived indefinitely on Azola panata. So we'll persist with our evaluations of this weevil, given the devastating impact that it can have on Azola panata in the field. Moving now to our less, less active projects, Downy rose myrtle or Rhodomyrtus tomentosa is native to large parts of Asia uh, from the central coast of mainland China through to eastern India and Sri Lanka. Uh, it has attractive pink flowers and was probably why it was introduced into the US as an ornamental. Why is downy rose myrtle a concern? This weed is spreading into new areas of central Florida and it's very, very difficult to kill. Even regrowing after intense fires are uh, seen on the right hand side of the slide. Initial control costs of treatment are $1,000 an acre with mechanical, herbicidal and fire control and subsequent costs are about $200 an acre each year for 10 years afterwards. We have conducted extensive surveys for natural enemies in many countries across Southeast Asia and at least 70 species of insect herbivores were collected. Many of these are yet to be identified and include an assortment of Lepidoptera and Coleoptera as well as bugs, thrips and grasshoppers. 
Initially, nine species were tested in quarantine in Florida, but none were spe uh, sufficiently specific and they were all rejected. The most promising insect for downy rose myrtle was a very damaging stem boring moth, Casmara sabagronoma. There are very few collection locations for this moth, which were all in Hong Kong. The larvae were very long lived and difficult to rear, and they're also difficult to test given there are only one generation per year. We made regular collections from Hong Kong for several years, and a quarantine culture was established in Gainesville. But unfortunately, the funding ceased on this project and the culture was promptly destroyed. There are still several promising insects to be uh, studied, including a tip feeding weevil, a Sternocopsis reticulatus, and a tip and fruit feeding moth, uh, Idiophancis ceruta. Hopefully, this weed will be revisited in the future, given the work we've put into it. Now, I'd like to give you an update on our highly successful project where we demonstrated real impact in biocontrol of a large tree species. Uh, the broadleaf paperbark tree, Melaleuca quinquinervia, grows along the east coast of Australia uh, in wetlands and uh, coastal areas. This paperbark tree became a highly invasive weed in Florida wetlands and it threatened the highly valued Everglades ecosystem. In the picture, you can see one of the Everglades tree islands completely covered in Australian paperbark trees, forming a virtual monoculture. These stands are like biological deserts and thousands of seedlings are germinating per square metre. As you can imagine, access for mechanical and chemical control was almost impossible. And at its peak, the tree infested 20% of all wetlands south of Lake Okeechobee in central Florida. Uh, further, opening of seed capsules is triggered by fire and herbicide spraying. And the resultant recruitment can be seen in the photo on the top right. Mechanical control wasn't feasible, and as a result, biocontrol was prioritised and seen as the only long-term solution for this invasive tree. Two biocontrol agents were initially released to facilitate the suppression of Melaleuca in Florida. The first was the Melaleuca weevil, Oxyops videocha, which was released in 1997 and fed on the flower and leaf buds and young foliage. And the second was the sap-sucking Boreodicaspis melaleuca, which was released in 2002. These two herbivores alone dramatically decreased plant production, growth, and survival of Melaleuca. The third insect to establish was a stem galling fly, Lophodoplosis trifida, which was released in 2008 and deformed plant tissue, causing branch death and also the death of seedlings and saplings. Another gall fly, Ferguson interneri, was released in 2005, but that failed to establish. In summary, Melaleuca covered 490,000 acres of southern Florida and it turned native sawgrass marshes into damaged swamps. Three biocontrol agents discovered by ABCL established in Florida and decreased the growth and reproductive capacity of Melaleuca and increased seedling mortality. In many sites, the native plant communities recovered following the biocontrol of Melaleuca. With integrated management, including biocontrol, Melaleuca now covers just a tenth of, of the Florida land it once did. For land managers, the major benefit is that uh, biocontrol complements mechanical and chemical control uh, by preventing the regrowth uh, following treatment. However, if more agents are required in future, they've already been investigated and prioritised by our lab in Brisbane. As an example, we have up our sleeve another agent, the gall, midge, Lophodoplosis indentata, which has completed quarantine testing by Melissa Smith at IPRL, and we're currently awaiting approval for release. The insect forms the pea galls on Melaleuca, and it's closely related to the stem gall midge, uh, Lophodoplosis trifida, which has already been so effective in Florida. The combined effect of both agents is really devastating in the laboratory, and that can be seen on the right-hand side of the slide. I've covered a lot of weeds quickly today, but I think it's important to make you all aware of not only the scope of targets that we're working on, but also the potential we have to assist in Australia and Asia with these and other US weed species. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attendance today. And uh, I'd also like to thank our wonderful collaborators and supporters. So thanks very much. Thank you, Matt. That was great. And with that, I would like to thank all of our presenters. And I will turn it over to Jen for our closing remarks. I just wanted to wrap up by thanking all our speakers for making time to share your really interesting work. And for those of you who worked late nights or early mornings to be here, um, thank you again to our USDA Forest Service for sponsoring this summit and biocontrol committee members and NAISMA staff for running everything so smoothly. If you aren't already a member, please join NAISMA. All members are welcome to join the biocontrol committee. If you would like more information, please feel free to contact me or Carrie. 
finally, thank you for joining today. we hope you've enjoyed the summit.